um, you know, um, I really want to thank you all again, because um, a lot of people who don't know what we do um, now get to see this again, this process again. And I'll echo with all the other district leaders have said, um, we will make this as fair as possible um, with your help. Um, so I didn't even introduce myself, but Shaquana Boykin, I am the female district leader and a city district 57. So that's um, Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, um, Western parts of Crown Heights, Bestai. Um, uh, we have a little bit of Prospect Heights um, and Clinton Hill. Please enjoy um, and I will pass it to Emil. Good evening, everyone. Hi, my name is Emil Bazell. Uh, I'm the male district leader for the 50th Assembly District. Uh, and it is absolutely an honor to be here and share this space with you all. Um, there isn't really much to say uh, that my uh, co-leaders have already covered. Um, so I'll just thank you all for joining and tuning in and really just taking the opportunity to listen to all these uh, candidates uh, running for a nomination for Supreme Court. Um, and of course, I want to give a big shout out uh, to Julio, who's really been like the forefront in all of this uh, and helping organize this with a lot of other district leaders. It's not easy uh, with all our full time jobs in our life outside of being district leader and community leaders. So Julio, thank you. And uh, I guess I'll popcorn into whoever hadn't had a chance to speak. Anyone can go. Uh, let's pass it to uh, Lori. <clears throat> Hi, <clears throat> forgive me for not showing my face. It's been a long day. My daughter, granddaughter's third birthday. Um, <clears throat> I just want to thank you also for putting this together. I have to say that I started this more than 20 years ago by convening the Women's Caucus of the Women Leaders because it was a male dominated process. What we did was meet each day for five to 10 days and have each candidate sign up for a time slot. We, we judged everybody on a even playing field by having people introduce themselves, give us a little background, and we asked the same exact questions to every single person. Therefore, we were able to judge between the candidates who gave the better of the answers or who we felt would best provide the most justice in the court. And being extremely familiar with both sides, um, it, was, it was important for me to have started it and make it more transparent. So I'm glad uh, after that lasted about 10 years and people lost interest that it is restarting again. And I thank you. Thank you, Lori um, and Sammy. Thank you everyone for being here. I'm district leader, Sammy Nemir Olivares, and thank you, Julio, uh, for being the driving force behind this um, collective effort to really transform the way that judges have been selected in Brooklyn, one of the largest counties in the country. So what happens here has uh, ripple effects throughout the country, and we need to continue to reform our criminal Job. This is where it begins. Uh, so this process uh, needs more transparency, more fairness. So people, uh, so delegates, county committee members, but also voters uh, understand how this process works, who are the judges, and that it deliver better justice for those seeking, you know, justice in the courts. So. Um, I'm optimistic and hopeful about this process uh, and continue to learn from a judge's qualifications uh, and how can we improve our justice system here in New York City. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. Um, so uh, I believe that is everyone. Uh, and with that said, uh, we can go ahead and get started. Um, I will be turning every now and then to my colleague, uh, Jesse, who will be assisting helping out in uh, some hosting. Uh, since we have several candidates here, uh, we will be splitting into um, uh, two groups. So there's gonna be a, a first panel kind of group of um, judges that we'll be dis work discussing this evening uh, that's on the agenda. Uh, we will be taking a short break.
uh, because I know some folks may need to use a restroom and then returning after uh, to uh, with our uh, second panel. Um, we will uh, give uh, each judge a three minute introduction allows for three minutes. You'll see a timer pop up on the corner of my screen. So just have folks, uh, you can look at my uh, window box to, to see. Um, I, I'm not sure if an actual timer will go off. We're, we're gonna be testing it out. Everyone's gonna be joining me this evening to see technology work in real time. Um, and then afterwards, we'll be opening it up to uh, questions. Uh, attendees, feel free to ask questions in the chat. We may read them off if, uh, and I'll just ask folks to, uh, let's just make sure to keep the chat, uh, you know, uh, professional, neutral, um, and on all of that good stuff. Uh, and um, afterwards, we'll proceed to the next uh, candidate. Um, and hopefully we'll get through in, uh, everyone, and then um, we'll be uh, moving on to the next panel. Um, and with that said, uh, I don't, I know one of our candidates is at the, uh, is going to be traveling, so we'll, we'll be accommodating them in the first panel, but I believe we can go ahead and start with um, uh, Joanne Quinones, if that's all right. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank all the district leaders for organizing this forum and inviting me to participate. I also want to send out a big thank you to the community for tuning in on a hot uh, Sunday evening in the middle of July so that we could introduce ourselves. Um, it's great and really comforting to be here with uh, many of my colleagues. Um, so a little bit about me. I am Joanne Quinones. I am a lifelong Brooklynite. I was born and raised in Bushwick. I now live in Fort Greene, Clinton Hill. I am a Latina. My family is from Puerto Rico. Um, I went to law school with one goal in mind, uh, to become a better servant to and for my community. And I'm proud to say that the entirety of my career, 25 years now, has been in public service. Um, I've served as a public defender with the Legal Aid Society's Criminal Defense Division, as a court attorney in criminal, civil, and Supreme Courts, all with the same judge, as a small claims arbitrator, and for the last 12 years as a judge. My first years were spent in criminal court, um, and I steadily progressed from sitting in an arraignment part to a trial part. In 2017, I was appointed an acting justice of the Supreme Court criminal term and was assigned a felony trial part. During the height of the pandemic, I volunteered to assist with the backlog in family court proceedings. So now I also handle matrimonial matters, including issues of custody and support on the civil term. Um, this past June, I was appointed to the Court of Claims for a term that expires this December on December 31st of 2022. In that capacity, I remain designated as an acting justice of the Supreme Court, and I continue to preside over matrimonial and felony indictments. Um, my experience as a judge has been challenging and rewarding. The, the cases that I handle, you know, whether criminal or civil, are often intense, high stakes, emotionally charged matters for the parties and their families. And as I consider each case, I am ever mindful that a, a decision that I make can change a life or lives forever. Um, for me, it's imperative that I do what I can to instill and maintain the public's confidence in our justice system and in the work that we do as judges. Um, this is something that I'm committed to both on and off the bench. Um, so I've shared a little bit about what I do on the bench. I'd also like to tell you a little bit of what I do off the bench. Um, I currently serve as the presiding member of the judicial section of the New York State Bar Association. I'm the first Latina to hold that position since the section was organized almost 100 years ago. Um, I'm a past president of the Latino Judges Association and the Brooklyn Women's Bar Association, and I serve on the boards of several other groups. Um, I also sit on the Franklin H. Williams Judicial Commission, and I chair the Equal Justice Committee for the Second Judicial District, uh, both of which are organi uh, organizations that are dedicated to ensuring the fair and equitable treatment of all court users and to promoting diverse hiring practices and opportunities for advancement across all titles in our court system. Um, I also lecture on the issue of implicit bias to bar and judicial associations. And most recently, I did that at this year's new judges seminar. Um, you know, my community work reflects my longstanding commitment to promoting and advancing diversity, inclusion, and access to justice. Um, and I can't really see the clock. Is three seconds, is that what it says? Yeah, you're, you're just about out of time, Judge. As I, please finish your thought, just. 
I was just going to say that I'm extremely passionate about mentoring, and I wanted to add that, that I take the time to mentor students. I accept anywhere from eight to 15 students per year to intern with me so that they can see the ins and outs of our justice system, and that it, that's one of the things that I'm probably most proud of. So um, I will leave it at that, and I'm sorry I used up all my time. <laughs> No, 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 sorry, it's necessary. That's exactly why you're here. Thank you so much uh, for, for sharing. Does anyone have any questions for Judge Quinones? I have a right. question, Judy. I'm sorry. I'm gonna pick up my hand right now. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Judge Quinones, I know that um, you were appointed um, this past June. Were you appointed by our governor? I was, yes. And um, can you explain why you feel that you need to run for Supreme Court now? Sure. Because everybody needs to understand, you know, the process. And, and um, that's just for full transparency. I think everyone is probably curious as to why. And so we have to ask these questions. No offense. No, 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 none at all. Um, you know, I will say that for the last five years, I've been an acting justice of the Supreme Court doing the same work as elected justices. And um, obviously I seek to move forward from the acting position to an elected position. Um, certainly I consider my appointment to the Court of Claims as a significant accomplishment in my career. Um, I had applied for that position prior to the pandemic. Um, so that was over two years ago. So you can imagine how surprised I was when I learned um, that I was nominated. Um, you know, I know that I am very privileged to have this position and to be able to continue to serve the community in that capacity. Um, but I still aspire to be a, a justice of the Supreme Court um, because there are differences between the two positions. I mean, you know, the most basic differences, of course, are that Supreme Court comes with a 14 year term and the Court of Claims comes with a nine year term, although I received a six month term, which expires in December because I received the tail end of Justice Demick's um, Court of Claims position and he was elevated to the Supreme Court. Um, additionally, uh, another difference is that there are different opportunities with each position. So, for example, with the Supreme Court position, you can serve beyond the age of 70 with, you can also apply to the appellate term or the appellate division. Neither one of those avenues is open to someone who is um, on the court of claims because the court of claims remains an acting justice of the Supreme Court and not a fully elected justice of the Supreme Court. Um, and finally, I would say that another difference is that the court of claims position is an appointed position, whereas the Supreme Court position is an elected position. and you know, I don't know that I could ever find the right words to describe what it would mean to me to be um, elected and chosen by the people of my community um, where I was born and raised. So um, that's why I'm still in this process um, and I still aspire to be a Supreme Court Justice. Okay, and um, just one last thing very quickly. So you're saying that someone that's sitting in the, in the Court of Claims cannot apply for the appellate court? Is that is that is that actual? Is that is that a fact? That's a fact. Some and um, I should distinguish. So the Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in our state, anyone can apply for that, even someone who is not currently a judge. However, for the appellate division and for the appellate term in the second departments, you can only apply if you are an elected Supreme Court justice. I don't know why. I don't know why that is. But for the highest court, you don't have to be elected, but for the appellate division and the appellate term, you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Assemblymember and Judge Quinones. Any other questions for Judge Quinones? Yeah, I'd like to ask one real quick. Um, thank you, uh, Judge Quinones. Um, there are uh, less uh, people with criminal defense backgrounds um, than, for example, prosecutorial backgrounds on the bench, and certainly fewer uh, and not enough people with um, uh, indigent defense uh, experience. And so I'm curious if you could speak to how, uh, as a judge, your experience, uh, you know, working for uh, one of the, uh, or more, I don't know, one or more of the uh, indigent defense organizations has kind of impacted 
uh, your judicial philosophy and, and how you approach uh, every day on the bench? Okay, thank you for that question. Um, I was with the Criminal Defense Division of the Legal Aid Society, so I did represent indigent folks who were charged with crimes um, in New York. Um, I would say that it has been probably one of the most incredible and invaluable experiences of my life, um, and it certainly impacts and informs the way that I um, serve as a judge. It gives me a unique perspective. Um, I, I represented people day in and day out, um, people who were probably some of our most vulnerable, you know, whose liberty rights were um, gonna be taken away. And I got to see the economic hardships that not only the defendants that I was representing um, were going through, but also their families, because, you know, I remember being asked when I decided to become a public defender by some friends, like, um, why, how could you? And, you know, my response was always like, how could I not? Right? Like, how could I not use the, the skills that I developed in law school to represent the indigent, to represent people who looked like me, to make sure that there was somebody who was safeguarding people's rights, um, you know, to ensure that people's rights, like the uh, right to be presumed innocent, uh, the right to a fair trial before a jury of your peers, to make sure that those rights were protected. So um, certainly now as a judge, um, you know, I, I, I'm no longer an advocate, but I definitely um, look at the burdens, um, you know, the burden of proof and the people's responsibility to meet that burden of proof. Uh, but on the opposite side, you know, if for example, a defendant takes a plea before me and promises to do X, then I also hold the defendant to that, you know, you promised to do X, that was a condition of your plea, you must do that. Um, so I would say that it definitely informs and impacts how I um, carry myself as a judge. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, just for time, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and hold questions unless somebody has one that's very burning. OK, great. Uh, Judge Kenyon, thank, thank you so much. Oh, Emil, do you have one? I was just going to say, I, uh, Robert Camacho asked, where in Bushwick were you born? Where you born? <laughs> I, I grew up on Bushwick and Lafayette. OK. And I'm still on the B38 now. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, Judge, thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, very much appreciate it and, and all our questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so, so I uh, I think we had somebody else on the agenda, so just uh, diligently following. I, I see that uh, Judge uh, Patria Frias Colon, and I very much apologize if I mispronounce any name. Please correct me if I get it wrong. Uh, but uh, Judge Frias Colon, are you? Are you available to give us uh, three minutes of your time? I think she's still uh, in transit, so we can come back to okay. that. Okay, great. Uh, then uh, we'll move on to Judge Adam Perlmutter. I think I, I feel like I, I saw Adam. You pronounced it perfectly. Oh, thank you. I You're appreciate welcome. that validation. You're welcome. Good evening, everybody. Um, I like to Give a, I want to just kind of give a general background of my work. Uh, I was born in New Haven and raised there until high school. Uh, I went to college in New York and graduated from Columbia. And then I went to law school in Wisconsin and I moved back to New York. And I always like to think that I really never really understood how the law worked until I moved to Brooklyn. I want to thank everybody for having us tonight. Julio, thank you for putting this together. All the district leaders, my colleagues attending. Um, as you know, I am Adam Perlmutter. I'm a, I sit as a judge in the criminal court. I moved to Brooklyn in 97. I was living in Tribeca and commuting on my motorcycle to Kew Gardens for my job at the district attorney's office. And I had to find a place closer because the commute was killing me. And I moved to Greenpoint and I fell in love. Uh, the reason why I fell in love is kind of complicated. First, there was an old synagogue around the block from me and I thought it was abandoned and falling in on itself. And it turned out that there was actually life in the place. And now 25 years later, we've restored and revitalized what turns out to be Brooklyn's oldest synagogue building. Uh, in, my, in 2000, in March of 2000, I, I'd left the DA's office earlier that year. And my neighbors contacted me and said that Con Edison wanted to build a power plant on the Greenpoint waterfront. 
Uh, Assemblyman Joe Lentall, who many of you know, uh, asked if I'd become involved as a lawyer. I volunteered my time and did 16 years of pro bono legal work that resulted in stopping two power plants from being built on the North Brooklyn waterfront, as well as doing legal work credited with creating the Bushwick Inlet Park, which is being built now. Alongside that work, I built a successful uh, private practice handling criminal cases and civil rights litigation. Uh, a few years after I started my practice, the federal judges in Manhattan and in Brooklyn appointed me to take assigned indigent cases. I represented uh, James McTeer, a folk nation leader in a death penalty trial. I did very, very high profile cases and you can certainly go and uh, search me on the internet and see uh, cases where I've been mentioned in the press and the media. And I'm proud to say, I don't think you'll find anything there that would make you anything but proud to, be to have me associated with the bench in New York State and Brooklyn in particular. My most significant case in private practice was eliminating qualified immunity uh, for prison guards accused of sexual abuse. And that was in a landmark case in the Second Circuit that I litigated. I never thought about becoming a judge until the summer of 2014, when I was invited to be a participant in the Aspen Institute's Law and Society Seminar. And I flew out to Aspen and I joined 22 very leading minds in the law in this country, people that had were law school deans, law school professors, sitting judges, many people that had uh, clerked on the United States Supreme Court. There was even one person that argued 43. Hi, Judge, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, just uh, hoping, uh, asking you to finish your thought and then we'll sure. move on to questions. Thanks. Anyway, by the end of the session, by the end of eight days of discussions, these judges and, and these participants thought that based upon my very broad experience in the law, that I should apply to the bench. And I did and Mayor de Blasio appointed me. I've spent the last five years on the bench. I've uh, totally redesigned DWI uh, court practices in the, in the county, including through COVID to ensure that there was no rise in DWI crimes during COVID. And we were successful in that. And now I sit uh, often in upfront felony uh, uh, part in uh, 320 as an acting. I also sit arraignments and I'm a member of the New York, I'm an advisory uh, member appointed to the New York Justice Task Force, which has been leading uh, transformative change in the criminal justice system for the last 15 years in a whole host of areas. I wanna be on Supreme Court to continue my work, to expand the uh, power of my influence uh, and to use the resources of an elected Supreme Court justice to advance equal access to justice for all of the communities and individuals who live here in Brooklyn. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Judge. Uh, I see Sammy with your hand up. We'll start with Sammy and uh, we'll, we'll go with uh, anyone else if they have uh, other questions. Thank you so much. Hi, Sammy. Hi, uh, thank you, Judge Palmetto, for coming and for uh, filling out the questionnaire. My question is, could you elaborate more on uh, question 14, where we asked about an area that judges need more training and you answer bail. So sure. what's your position about bail? What about bail um, would you would like judges to be trained on? What do you think is the issue with bail in the, in the Supreme Court? Thank, thank you for the question. And, and you know, the issue with bail doesn't just extend to Supreme Court. Bail starts in criminal court. Um, and often uh, Supreme Court justices will sit on those arraignment decisions and then will further and engage on those arraignment decisions when the cases transfer post indictment to Supreme Court. But I'll give you an example. I mean, we just saw the Lee Zeldin uh, situation upstate and that it has kind of re-sparked uh, press uh, discussion about uh, bail. You know, that's a case where uh, somebody was charged with a non-qualifying bail offense. Bail, cash bail could not be set. But there are a whole host of opportunities with supervision where you can make conditions of mental health counseling and interventions that can help to alleviate public concerns about bail. And so when I say that I think judges need to be trained more on bail, it's that I think judges need to be, have, have a real awareness of what their options are, 
uh, and what they can do with bail, because there is flexibility within the bail statute to address a lot of the concerns. Another example, um, I, there's, a, there's somebody who's been studying the bail uh, data very carefully. Uh, there's been two massive data dumps by the court system of uh, bail decisions for every bail decision in the state. Uh, these are spreadsheets that literally cover hundreds of thousands of data fields. I know, for example, for me personally, during the, over my whole career of bail, there have been nine people that I have released on bail that have been rearrested on gun crimes, and nobody has been involved in a gun crime where a weapon has been discharged. I also know that in 23% of the cases where I have white defendants in front of me, I will set bail. And in, with African-American uh, individuals, that number pops up to about 28%. I will tell you right now that I don't think any judge that you will see tonight knows those statistics about their own bail practices. And they should. They should be aware of them. They should learn from them. They should decide whether their bail practices are in conformance with, with what their values are. And it's only by digging down deep into that data that you can do that. And I think that that's the thing that has to be done. So that's one of the reasons why I, I highlighted that as in my answer. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and shift over to District Leader Shaquana Boykin. That's Shaquana. Hey, Judge. Um, you know I'm all about the youth, so I wanted to know um, in very short and sweet, if you can, if you can tell me um, what one or two ways that you would say you are effective um, in um, working with young people in the court system. Well, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Uh, a few weeks ago, I, had, I was sitting in the, in the upfront felony part, and the, a case came up in front of me, a young African-American male. He was 18 years old. And they said, we have a, he had two cases in front of him. And they said, we have, we have a disposition judge. He's going to plead to assault in the third degree with a conditional discharge and an order of protection to cover both cases. And, you know, whenever I have somebody young like that in front of me, well, whenever I have anybody in front of me and they say that the person is going to plead to a criminal charge, I want to know, is, is my case that I'm sitting on going to give that person a criminal record? And I looked at his rap sheet and I saw there was no, he had no, he had no prior arrests. And then I looked at the complaints in those cases. And you know what I realized? He had two assault cases, one on an NTA worker, one on somebody else. They were both on the same day. He'd been arrested on two separate cases on the same day. I said, wait, what's going on here? And the, the, the defense attorney said, well, it turns out like his parents, he, he's discovered that he's a chronic alcoholic. And he was on a binge and he got arrested on, bo on both of these cases. And my reaction was then why, why are you putting him out to a, to, to a misdemeanor? Have you talked about it with, with the DA? Is there, is there treatment that he can do? Is there a better way to approach this case to address his underlying needs as opposed to just having me have him plead guilty to a disorder, to, 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 a, to a crime and send him out in the world with a criminal record? So that's an example. Thank you. Yeah, I can give you more, but I know we're on a tight time frame, but that's just one small example of just stopping the process and taking the time to really figure out who's in front of you and what, what is their situation and how can we use our power to address that. Thank you, Sammy, uh, Shaquana, and uh, Judge Perlmutter. I'm going to freeze on questions there, but I, I am going to uh, now uh, uh, ask this question of each candidate uh, that uh, I'm finding the name, Dana, Dana Rashland. Dana, I'm sorry if I pronounced your last name wrong. And I'm just going to ask this question to each judge. And so I'm going to ask to keep it to a simple yes or no in, um, in, in just keeping time in mind. Uh, so Judge Perlmutter, I'm going to ask it the same for everybody. Uh, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? Simple yes or no? No. Thank you. Uh, and Judge Quinones, thank you for continuing to be here. I'm also going to ask the same thing to you. Simple yes or no? Are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? 
And I'm sorry, District Leader Pierce, I can't answer yes or no, just because as a sitting judge, I can't opine on pending legislation. So unfortunately, I can't answer the question. My duty as a judge is to follow the law as it's written. Thank you. I uh, I appreciate uh, even knowing that. I, I think it's it's good to get that answer too, just so people are familiar with the process about what uh, judges, sitting judges can or cannot answer. So I, I appreciate both of those answers. Thank you I so just much. Say there, there is no pending legislation. It's a matter of public discussion and it is within our ambit as judges to discuss it. I think that- Can I chime in for a moment, please? All right, Thank sorry. You. Uh, can I chime in? Um, there may not be at the moment um, any pending legislation, but there may be amendments and Quinones is right. Um, so I would ask people not to um, get too in, entrenched in what, what, what the law, um, how the law is written or whether or not it's a hypothetical question, um, but there are um, some pending um, legal matters in Albany that mm -hmm. judges should not be answering yes or no to. So I would just wanted to chime in on that. So uh, thank you for that. Um, so did I get to withdraw my answer? No, listen, I mean, it's already answered. I think there needs to be clarification. There may not be, as you're not aware of it, but I am, that there may be amendments to bail reform. So it's better not to talk about it. Let's just let's just stay um, with the answers that each individual um, candidate has answered. And I think that was why Pearl Mother were, was asked the question because it was already on the um, on his um, questionnaire. Just a suggestion. You don't have to listen to me. I am just making a suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, Ed, Ed, thank you so much, uh, Assemblymember. I think uh, I, I think we'll continue to ask the question because I do think it's relevant in terms of current events and uh, the the politics that are currently going on in the city and the state. But it's certainly not meant as a gotcha question. The whole purpose of the forum is to provide transparency to the process and to introduce the candidates to delegates and also voters. And so I think you should answer as you're most comfortable with uh, from a, an integrity standpoint. We wouldn't want to ask anything else. Jesse, I just want to I just want to hit that last point that you said and, and make sure that uh, nobody on this panel is is uh, thought to be evading the answer or uh, that in any way they're not being comfortable asking a, a political question as a sitting judge is held against them in any way. Everybody has a different comfort level and, and understanding of where that line is. And I would just ask everybody uh, to withhold any judgment for any judge that does or does not uh, answer the question, because I want to be fair uh, to the to the judges on this panel about, uh, you know, what political questions they do and don't don't answer. Yep. thank you. I think uh, I think that's great information for everybody. OK. I think uh, thank you, Judge Perlmutter, for your statement and also your your time answering questions and everybody who asked. We're gonna move on to uh, uh, Judge. Oops, sorry, I lost my, my place. Judge Frias Colon, uh, who I think is ready now. Good evening, everyone, and I want to thank the. Uh, district leaders for putting together such an important forum uh, about me a little bit more than what you've already uh, received. Uh, I've always been that person that will not be the complainer in the room, right? And so when you have a skill set where you've had 25 plus years experience uh, without disciplinary history as an attorney, and I saw having practiced in, in both uh, the city courts, the state courts, uh, the appellate courts, uh, I saw that there were some great judges and I saw that there were some not so great judges. And so I also saw that there was a lot of, uh, that there was injustice when you appeared before someone to talk about your situation as, as the courts are people's last resort. And when I experienced uh, judges not being, um, thoughtful in the process, the, the judicial process, I said, I have to uh, do 
what my skill set allows me to do. And so that was the determination uh, in 2017 when I decided I was going to run for civil court. And uh, with a lot of support from many people, I was able to succeed. And so five years, fast forward to five years now down the road, uh, I, always, I always knew that I did need to be elected to the Supreme Court because like Judge Quinones talked about, it is a step further in the direction that I think I ultimately want to be or give myself the option, which is to get to the appellate division. Because I think that uh, those are the courts where we need to see uh, diversity to ensure that there's equity and to ensure that there is justice in everything that comes across a judge's desk. And so I was that person in the room who says, who will say always inevitably, and I'm still that way, that if I see something that is not right, I'm gonna speak up about it. And I think it is important that we do so through our, uh, it, we need to do so in, a, in an equitable way, in a legal way, and in a just way. And so uh, I'll leave it there and I'll open it up for any questions that any of the members may have. Thank you for the opportunity to all of you. Thank you, Judge. Yeah, you, you do have 45 seconds just in case you want to fill it at all, but we're happy to shift you to questions. No, I'm okay. I'm ready for questions. Great. Uh, okay. Uh, anyone with questions? I see there's two questions on Q&A, so Jesse, I don't know if you want to start with there. Yeah, uh, so I, I, I'll start with the with Dana's questions first that, uh, that we just talked about. Uh, but the question is, uh, are you in supportive efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? I, uh, I'm going to take the liberty not to answer that question, given the conversation, the discussion I'm in, that already happened regarding that. But I will, as a sitting judge, follow the law as it's performing, always. Thank you so much for that. Uh, another question that we have uh, in the queue uh, from one of our attendees uh, is from uh, Janice Henderson in Fort Greene, uh, Clinton Hill, the 57th, I'll say, I, I don't know uh, which neighborhood Janice lives in, but she said, with, we've seen with the US Supreme Court how the conservative slash Republican justices used their political opinion to overturn Roe v. Wade. A to Judge Thomas, Justice Thomas has indicated that other judicial liberties may be overturned. Uh, when you make your decisions, does your p political slash personal leanings come into play when you're interpreting the, the law? Absolutely not. And, and, and no judge should. That's part of the problem, I think, that does exist in our judiciary and specifically in New York State, so much so that there was a report recently by uh, former Secretary Jay Johnson uh, outlining a lot of the issues. And one of the things that he found among many issues within our court system that resulted in just outcomes was bias. And to me, any judge who is bringing in their personal, political, religious, or any belief, incorporating them into their decision-making should not be a judge, period. Uh, I don't necessarily have a, a question, it's a question slash comment, but I think uh, I also wanted to know, uh, uh, Judge Frias Colon, we, we asked this question in our questionnaire about implicit bias, right? because I think for the very reason that you just stated, um, because New York and unfortunately the Supreme Court, uh, this is a, uh, an, an issue that a lot of personal feelings and personal opinions are often played out in decisions. Um, and uh, it, it's, it, it, pl it plays out in, in how decisions are, are coming about. And I think, um, one of the things that we see is a lot of uh, the greatest uh, things that in terms of like training we're seeing is like, how do we identify blot bias, but either implicit or explicit. Um, and it, it, it's becoming a, a thing that it's, it's really very important in, in the judicial system. So thank you for, for naming that. Yeah, and I will add, uh, District Leader Pena, that as a result of that report, which was a very lengthy report, but unfortunately is a report that we saw 40 years before as well with very little changes. And so we really have to work hard, but I have to say that the chief judge after the um, 
George Floyd murder, she put together this uh, task force for that and, that. and ultimately they came up with that report. One of the things that I think we need to be clear about is that uh, from the top down, the, New York, the unified court system is doing implicit bias training for everyone, not just judges, all the clerks, everybody, the court officers, and so I think that we're in the we're we're definitely in the right direction. And compared, I think maybe to other states, uh, we're ahead uh, in terms of that issue. But um, there's more work to be done. More work needs to be done. One of the things that I really love about the unified court system is that they really rolled up their sleeves. They put together the Equal Justice in the Courts Committee, which is a, it is a, a statewide committee. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to be appointed on that committee. And together we're developing, continuing to develop protocols and procedures to ensure that the mission that the chief judge uh, decreed that, and, and, and that we follow, which is to ensure that the mission be met. And so I'm very happy to be a part of that. Uh, again, not a complainer, but let's get it done. It is important and it has to happen and it will happen. Thank you for that. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I think that we're out of time for questions, but I, I just wanted to give space in, in case anyone had any that they wanted to ask before we move on. Okay, uh, Judge Friesgalen, thank you so much for your remarks uh, and also your answers. Uh, we very much appreciate the time. And we will uh, move on to uh, Judge Ann Swern. Uh, who was a former district leader in the 52nd. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you, Julio, and thank you, everybody, for putting this together and having 81 people listen to us. That is outstanding. Um, and I know being a district leader, as Jesse said, is sometimes thankless, but it's so important because you represent the people who elected you, you represent your communities, and it's very important to us. So we thank you for this time, and we thank you for this opportunity to address you. I want to be um, uh, go to the Supreme Court and uh, get nominated to the Supreme Court for three specific reasons. So number one, I want to apply my unique skills and qualifications to complex civil and or criminal cases. Number two, I want to be able to work past the man mandatory retirement age of 70. I am 66 years old. I have a term that extends beyond the time I, I turn 70, but I won't be able to fulfill my term unless I'm elected to the Supreme Court and then certificated by the court system. And finally, I'd like to return from Manhattan to Brooklyn, the borough of my birth, the borough of my election, the borough of my education, and the borough where my family lives. And if I get nominated to Supreme Court, that may happen. So my unique skills, for 42 years, 42 years I've served the public as a lawyer. I've done 33 years at the Kings County District Attorney's Office, rising to the second highest level of that office, first assistant district attorney. I served four separately elected district attorneys there. I've done many things in that office. I investigated cases. I conducted jury trials, such as rape, kidnapping, domestic violence, and homicide. In fact, one of the most significant homicide cases I prosecuted was back in 1990, a police officer killed an unarmed man on Eastern Parkway and the my direct examination and part of the trial was captured in a book called Upon This Rock, The Miracles of the Black Church. And I was privileged to be in that book and I was much more privileged to prosecute that case, especially in 1990 when it wasn't in the public's consciousness the way it is today. Finally, um, I was the, in charge of alternative sentencing policy and programming. And doing that, I created with the stakeholders of Brooklyn, um, the Red Hook Community Justice Center, the Mental Health Court, the Misdemeanor and Felony Substance Abuse Courts, the Drug Treatment Alternative to Prison Court, the Treatment Alternatives to Dually Diagnosed Defendants, Common Justice, and the Sex Trafficking Court. And the reason that these courts are so important is they help to avoid a criminal record if one shouldn't happen, and some of my colleagues have spoken about that, and also to avoid or address the things that led people to come to the criminal justice system in the first place. And so in doing that, um, two successive district attorneys have followed these policies and programs, and these courts are still operational today. 
And finally, I've supervised, supervised thousands of lawyers, including some of the people you'll hear from tonight. And it was my pleasure to do so. And especially back in 1980, when I started, there weren't many women in the courts. And I was particularly honored and privileged to mentor the young women coming through because I didn't have a mentor when I came through. Um, because of all of this and the relationships I built, I was chosen to be managing counsel at the Brooklyn Defender Services. So basically I was hired- Sorry to interrupt, I just wanted to let you know we're at time, but please finish your thought. I was hired by my adversary to uh, represent, um, represent people who could not afford a lawyer. I'm a professor at Brooklyn Law School. I created the program. I was the alumni of the year. I was on the task force to create national policy for alternative sentencing. And I currently, as I said, sit in Manhattan and I can discuss arraignments all night with you guys and bail all night with you guys. And I will say this before you ask the question. I agree with Judge Canonis. I agree with um, Assembly Member Davila. And I agree with my colleague, um, uh, Judge Brias Cologne, that we cannot comment on possible pending litigation. What I will say to you, or legislation, is that people have watched me all the time. Court watchers with their yellow t-shirts have watched me in arraignments. I sat there for five months and my what my arraignments decisions were recorded by the court watchers. And finally, I invite you to look at the letter from my student who was also a legal aid attorney who spoke to my ability as a professor and also as a person who, a judge who heard her cases and her clients. Thank you so much, Judge Smart. Uh, I appreciate you answering the question. I appreciate before. you, Jesse. <laughs> uh, I will open it up uh, for anyone else for, for questions. I actually have a question. Um, this is actually from uh, Lori, uh, leader Lori Citronipo, who posted in the chat earlier. Um, uh, what's your most important uh, case that you have heard, uh, and why is that? Why has it had a lasting impact on you? Hmm. The most important case I heard. I, I hear. I can hear a hundred cases in any given day, um, and so as a judge. I'd say, I, I'm just gonna talk about a recent case instead of the most important. There was a case of a person who had five misdemeanors in front of me and had never been given the opportunity for substance, substantial treatment. And I was talking to an, uh, um, an assistant DA in Manhattan about their lack of, of, of confidence in treatment. And I think that comes from not well-monitored, well-supervised treatment that's not high quality. And so in this particular matter, this defendant was an alcoholic and he was a substance abuser. And he had five cases in front of me, of which three of them, the complaining witness didn't want to participate in the, in, in, with the prosecution. And what I was able to do, because I know the head of the Fortune Society, Joanne Page, I know all of the players here, I was able to get them on the video to agree to put him in residential treatment for 28 days, followed by aftercare. He will appear before me by video every week that he's in treatment, because I don't want people to not have confidence in treatment because of the lack of quality or the lack of supervision. And you don't need a specialty court like a drug court or like a mental health court to be able to use the principles of therapeutic jurisprudence. That's what I teach in law school and that's what I do every day. So I can't say the most important case. They're all important, Lori. You know something to those defendants and to those lawyers, every single case is important. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have anybody else? Okay, thank you so much, Judge Smart. I'm gonna go ahead and, and move us along. I do wanna acknowledge one question that we got from Genevieve, uh, which the question was, can someone explain why some judges have done the nomination process before, I meaning the nomination process to be elevated to the Supreme Court? Is it because uh, they weren't uh, elected uh, in prior times? Is um, It might be helpful to note why some people were nominated before and weren't recommended to the ballot. I, I just wanted to share the question kind of broadly uh, in case uh, somebody wants to answer, I think the I think to, to my I'll just give my interpretation is that I think it depends on the candidate, and there are lots of 
differing circumstances in, uh, in terms of the process, in terms of why someone might have uh, put themselves forward before, but weren't necessarily nominated uh, for the ballot. Uh, but I did just want to give, uh, ask the question because it was provided by one of the panelists. Um, Jesse, yeah. can I just quickly suggest that, for example, tonight we're listening to 21 candidates for 10 spots. Frequently, there's many more people who want this job than available jobs. And so we keep trying and persevering to get the position. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, as good an answer uh, as any, although I, I, I do want to encourage anyone to to share their answers. If uh, Judge Perlman or, or Keen Yunus or uh, Frias Cologne, if you uh, maybe want to share in the chat, if, if you'd like. But uh, I did just want to put the question out there because it, it was asked. But thank you, Judge Swarn. I think that's a... Uh, a very good answer. Uh, so uh, moving us along, I will shift over to Judge Ellen Spodek. After three years, I'm still figuring out how to unmute. But thank you all for doing this. Um, I, I think it's so important. I myself was an elected uh, judicial delegate in a contested race in Manhattan. I went to the judicial convention. I think it's very important that you're all informed about what's going on. And I applaud all the district leaders for uh, doing this forum. Um, I'm also a born and bred Brooklynite. I uh, worked at a law firm in the city and the partner came up to me and after a discussion and said to me, you know, you sound like you're from Brooklyn. I said, I am from Brooklyn. You got a problem with that? And everyone started laughing. So I, I when Lori um, Nipel mentioned that she did the Women's Caucus, I participated in, in that 20 years ago when I first ran for civil court. I also participated in um, 2008 when I ran for Supreme Court. I was nominated that year by the governor for an interim Supreme Court spot but then ran, um, see, I, I then sought out everyone's support to be on the ballot and I was very blessed to have it. Since then, I have not been able to go to any of these four to, four to forums. It's very frustrating that when you're sitting on the bench, your four, first amendment rights are taken away from you. We can't comment on possible pending lit litigation. We can't go to debates that might be sponsored by the Democratic party. We can't do any of those things that I, as a citizen, would like to do. Um, and that's uh, frustrating. I've had uh, a 20 year career on the bench, serving in civil family, back to civil as the supervising judge, uh, then Supreme Court. And in April of 2020, when Judge Nipel was in the hospital with COVID, I served as the acting administrative judge and I don't know who was happier when he was able to come back to work, me or Lori, but um, I was thrilled. But it was a wonderful experience. I also, I mentor, I have interns and I've participated in the last five years in the mentorship program through the um, Simon Wiesenthal um, Center. And I've, have, uh, I've been in touch with those interns and um, those, they don't intern for me, they intern somewhere else, but I meet with them. Um, and I think I have 30 seconds left, but I'll open it up if anyone has any questions. I answered the questionnaire. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to discuss my record. Thank you so much, uh, Judge Budak. And uh, I, I just, for the record, want to acknowledge it, it from the in terms of rolling back to New York's bail reform, you answer the same as uh, Judge Warren and Judge Quinones in terms Correct. of not commenting. Also on, on the, um, I just, I'm on the ethics advisory committee for the judiciary, as is Judge Quinones. So I think that we both are, um, it's more heightened the awareness of what you can and can't do than people who might not be on the committee. So in defense of um, Adam, he feels that since it is already a, an existing law, maybe he can say something, but I feel we should not be saying anything. Right. I mean, I, I think this fits squarely within the advisory committee's opinion 2042, which says that subject to general applicable limits on judicial speech and conduct, a judge may publicly comment on the recently enacted bail reform legislation. 
Um, that's from the advisory committee, but I, I, I don't think we have to belabor the issue too much. Thank you. No, I agree. And I don't, I don't do any criminal either. I do all civil cases. Um, my only um, interaction with criminal law was when I sat in family court in the delinquency part. I think I it's, can't hear you it's just, oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think it's uh, also just very positive to be having these kinds of conversations uh, for the awareness uh, and information sharing uh, that we're just doing more broadly. So I appreciate everyone uh, uh, bearing with me and also uh, for just providing their, their responses and a little bit of background. Uh, and okay, so I will uh, thank you, Judge Spodek, and I will open it up to the floor for questions. I have a question, Judge. Uh, I'd love to know how do you deal with difficult people, like including peers, lawyers, clients, litigants? What's your approach? So, so I have a very, very, very long fuse. And I think when I was in civil court in small claims, one night I raised my voice and the court officers came rushing in judges, everything okay, is it was so unusual for me. And they, and my father had been a judge and they said, what were you, did you, were you channeling your father? And I'm like, no, it just, you know, it was just frustrating. But usually on that respect, I listen to my mother and count to 10. And if it's, I take a break. I say to everyone, we're going off the record, taking a 10 minute break, I'll go in the back. If it's something that I feel that I'm having difficult dealing with, I will call a colleague to say, look, this is what's going on. Am I overreacting? Or, you know, what, do you have a suggestion? When the 10 minutes is up, I go back in and I handle the situation. Um, but I, the, when I was in family court, I never once raised my voice. I never lost my temper. Um, one of the, one of the um, delinquents who I had uh, put in various programs, the third time he AWOLed and he came back in, said to me, judge, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know, just do what you have to do. And because he knew I was gonna have to put him in a more restrictive environment. But I, I, I guess, I don't know why, but I don't, I'm naturally calm. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Emil. Uh, anyone else before we move on? I, I, I just want to say I like the Q&A portions too, but also just want to be mindful of everyone's time because the, and I think it is very exciting how many candidates we have here and how many people we have participating. So not trying to, to push anyone along unduly. Uh, okay. Um, if there are no more questions, thank you so much, Judge Spodek, uh, for the time. I uh, very much appreciate it. And the uh, time with the questionnaire as well. Oh, I just want uh, to come up for re-election. I'm already a sitting uh, Supreme Court judge. Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate that clarification. Um, and uh, we'll move on to Aaron Maslow next. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for conducting this forum and thank you for inviting me. So most people in Brooklyn know of my work in the field of election law. However, my 40 years of being an attorney has included much more. And this has included around 35 years performing quasi judicial work. Early on in my career, I was a New York City administrative law judge. For the past 20 years, I've served as an arbitrator for the American Arbitration Association. And in that capacity, I've written about 10,000 decisions, which are called awards. Uh, I bring to the bench the ability to work in a time pressured atmosphere and determine disputes in an expeditious manner, fairly considering the positions of the parties. But the achievement that I am most proud of has been the assistance that I have given to colleagues by keeping them up to date on the case law. I've written three books in the field of insurance law, uh, which I arbitrate and I've trained new arbitrators, including how to best write decisions so that they cover the facts and the law. 
and explain cogently why they've reached their respective determinations. In 2016, I began to present continuing legal education courses. And in 2018, the state of New York certified me as an accredited provider of continuing legal education. At a certain point in time, uh, judges, uh, court attorneys became aware of these books I had written and my CLE courses. They requested copies and requested to be apprised of my CLEs. By now, I've presented over 50 of them. Um, actually, some judges, including at least one who's here with us today, has been on my panels. Um, I've also covered other subjects besides no fault law. Last fall, I presented a CLE uh, in conjunction with Underground Railroad Month uh, on the Garrett Hunt trials, uh, which took place in the Newcastle, Delaware courthouse in um, 1848. And this brought up for consideration ethical discussions, discussions about how judges and attorneys confront unjust laws. So while in private practice, I have engaged in litigation. Some of, of this private practice that took place before I was an arbitrator, because as an arbitrator for no fault insurance, you are precluded from engaging in certain matters such as negligence and auto accidents. But I did trip and fall, auto accidents, negligence, labor law matters. Uh, I handled lead paint poisoning cases. Um, so that was in litigation. I also presented around 60 arguments at appellate courts state and federal. I took a constitutional issue to the US Supreme Court, which unfortunately denied my motion uh, for certiorari. Um, there are 12 positions altogether, including those of the two incumbents. I seek your endorsement. I'm 65 years old. In the remaining time I have in the legal profession, I want to make the best contribution I can. And at this point, it would be to serve as a judge. Thank you so much, uh, Aaron. I, I appreciate your timeliness. Uh, I do just want to ask uh, the question that we're asking each person. Are, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? OK, so actually, and this uh, goes along with what Judge Katanji Brown Jackson testified to at her confirmation hearing, in, especially in terms of criminal law, it is up to the legislative branch to make certain determinations expressing the will of the people for existence, for existence and sentencing guidelines. This is a bit similar, not exactly the same. So I do have to respect whatever decision the legislature makes. But I will say the following, as it exists now, because that is something that exists now, it's not proposed. We have a law right now. I do agree with Judge Perlmutter that as it exists now, there are things which can be done to ensure that the person returns back. That is the goal of bail, that they uh, come back for that trial. There are conditions that can be placed uh, subject to uh, things that can happen if you don't comply with them. Um, and um, that is, uh, again, but again, in terms of changing it, um, that is up to the legislature. Got it. Uh, thank you so much for your answer. I'll, I'll open up the floor for anyone else. Did you want me to answer the question about the, um, I'm going to, the uh, political leanings? Uh, uh, sure. Why don't we just like, uh, why don't we give a moment to see if anybody else has any questions? But I think if, if not, I think it's fine uh, for you to move on and answer that question as well. I, I, have, I have a bunch of questions. So I, I, Mr. Maslow, I'd ask that you keep them your answers to the extent possible. I'm going to try to ask them narrow as opposed to broad. So I'd ask you just to try to keep them uh, responsive to the questions. Um, the, the, the first question um, is, if you could just clarify, uh, have you been a registered uh, member of the, of the Democratic Party for the, let's say, the duration of the, the entirety of the last 15 years? Uh, for the last 15 years, uh, probably, yes, I, well, I believe I changed the enrollment 2010, started off as a Democrat, uh, then changed to Republican, I think I was Republican for about 10, 12 years, something like that, don't hold me exactly, and then went back to being a Democrat. And during that time, uh, you made contributions to uh, Republican Party, the Conservative Action Fund. Uh, friends of Marty, Marty Golden, I guess, was before that. But but you were a 
a contributor to um, to both conservative and, and Republican uh, uh, parties and, and candidates, correct? Uh, during the time I was enrolled in the Republican Party. And I also, make, I also make contributions to Democratic candidates. I made contributions to a variety of entities providing legal services to criminal defendants, domestic violence survivors. I've made contributions to animal uh, rights organizations, um, charities. And in the last uh, few years, you've, you've provided a lot of uh, legal support for the, for the Brooklyn Democratic Party, correct? Absolutely, that's correct. When you're an attorney, you represent your clients zealously, and uh, I did so, but when you become a judge, that all ends, politics is over. Were you compensated for that work or was it, uh, was it pro bono? Um, probably both, both. Um, and so it, did you report the pro bono? Is there any way I could see how much uh, pro bono work you did and what the value of uh, the, the financial value or the, uh, uh, of, that, of that work would have been had you charged them? Any uh, political candidates uh, were informed of the value of the work. It is up to political candidates to report it in disclosure statements. Okay, so uh, you haven't checked to see if any of the candidates that you worked for, uh, you know, as, as their attorney, you haven't checked to see whether or not you, they even reported the own work that you did uh, in any of their financial disclosures. Uh, no, I did not check on the candidates. That's correct. I'll just ask one more at it, just very quickly. You know, there are 26 uh, uh, judges. Exactly. Just to tell you, it is not always required that it be reported under the state election law. Um, it's not always required that it be reported um, uh, volunteer services, but go ahead. Well, you know what, then let me, let me just ask you this. Um, if you were to estimate, uh, just let's say in the last three years alone, uh, if, if you had billed the Brooklyn Democratic Party for all of the work you provided for, what would you, what would you estimate the amount of pro bono uh, in dollars it is that you have provided. I, I can on the spur of the moment give you that answer. Okay, if you wouldn't mind, um, I, I appreciate that. You know, I'm, I'm certainly a lawyer, not good at math. So you can always follow up and provide us uh, with that number. Um, the last question I just wanna ask is, there are 26 people um, who have been uh, found approved by the screening committee, uh, of which only four of them have never served uh, in any capacity as a judge. So what is it? that is uh, uh, so unique about you that we should bypass people with uh, uh, experience in, in many events, far more experience as a judge uh, and, and, make, and just put you right, onto the, uh, right into the Supreme Court. So you said far more unique. So that would involve myself comparing myself to the qualifications of the other candidates. And as a candidate for a judicial position, I'm not going to compare myself with other people. I think that would be improper. I do believe that my 40 years of legal experience, especially in the field of writing, has prepared me uh, for this position, including, including having uh, my arbitration work and including everything else that I've done in the legal profession. And so you think yeah. that that would be more qualified than the people that are already serving on the civil court? I'm not going to say more qualified because that, again, requires a comparison between myself and other people. And I'm not going to compare myself to other people. I'm presenting my qualifications and uh, I've been very open about it and uh, what my qualifications are. I sent out my CV to the district leaders, which I think was 13 pages something like that. And um, I believe I'm qualified to be nominated by the Democratic Party. I was found qualified by the screening panel. Well, thank you, Mr. Maslow. If you wouldn't mind following up with that, uh, those numbers um, that you had said that you'll, you'll provide. Thank you. I didn't say I would provide it. I, what I, my answer to your question was, you asked me on the spar of the moment and I said I couldn't provide it on the spar of the moment. Um, that was my answer. I uh, echo Doug, though, Mr. Maslow, that I, I think we would, uh, if it's possible for you to provide uh, us as district leaders that information, I think that that would be 
that would be relevant and helpful. Uh, but I will go ahead and shift over to uh, District Leader Sammy Olivares. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, thank you, Maslow, for coming. Um, I think my question is related to your position as the secretary of the party, especially during times where uh, recently has been a lot of uh, anomalies, including you know people that were included in petitions without their consent. Uh, what what is your position about? those that that process electoral process um and how can we have confidence that you will be impartial when it comes to decisions related to the democratic party or related to uh those district leaders and the king's county when i announced my candidacy on june 3rd i resigned as secretary of the party and uh, the only politics i've engaged in since then are in support of my own candidacy when you become a judge, there's no more politics. Everybody is treated the same, regardless of who you are, in terms of considering your arguments, if you're an attorney, your situation, the facts, if you're a party. Politics is over then. Okay, thank you. I, I think, uh, I guess, just to, to follow up, on Sammy's question, though, I think acknowledging the fact that you you had resigned your position, but you do you have any comment or um, do you have any comment or anything you'd like to share regarding the reports of the the fraudulent signatures and and other a fraudulent activity that was uh, reported by the city uh, regarding signatures in the in the petition process as your as your with regarding your former position as the lawyer for the Brooklyn Democratic Party? As a lawyer uh, doing legal work, obviously I'm not going to comment on uh, matters um, pertaining to, to people whom I represented. That would be inappropriate. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think, Lori, I did see your hand up briefly, though you did take it down. I just wanna check if you had any questions. I just, I just wanted to point out that if he did do um, work other than pro bono for any candidate, it is not up to his, um, uh, it's not his responsibility, it's the person he did the work for's responsibility to disclose and to put it on their financial statements. That may be true, but nonetheless, I, this is not somebody providing printing services. This is somebody providing legal services. And I would, uh, in my own candidacy, certainly expect uh, that my attorney would, uh, of all people, make sure that uh, at least as far as his name goes, or her name goes, or their name goes, uh, that that it's done properly. Um, so, but, you know, it's not- But he's not required to file a statement with the Board of Elections, the candidate is. I think you have this a little mixed up, Doug. Okay. And I, think I just, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Assembly Member Davila. I was just going to shift yeah, this. I just, it over. I just think that we have this whole thing a little kind of uh, mixed up. And I don't think we should continue to have this discussion um, while we're interviewing other um, candidates. However, we're talking about the Democratic Party. Um, and uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Aaron Maslow, you are responsible um, to the people that elect Kings County um, leadership. And so therefore you are responsible to us. And so I'm gonna leave it at that. You don't have to answer, but understand that we are the Democratic Party. There should not be any separation, and if uh, if there are questions that should be answered, um, you should be responsive to us as the Democratic Party. I'm going to leave it at that. I respect your decision not to um, give us those answers. Um, I also respect the fact that you know you came to this forum, but um, these district leaders came in search of answers 
from all of these um, candidates and you are a candidate. Um, you're in a unique position because you are coming out of um, the county leadership to um, run for the seat. And so therefore that makes you um, uh, responsible to answer any questions that we may have, mm -hmm. whether they're right or wrong, you can decline that. But we are the Democratic Party. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Aaron Maslow. I, I appreciate your responses and appreciate everyone's questions. Uh, we are definitely over time. I'm sure no one is, is surprised about that. Uh, so we will move on to uh, Judge Susan Quirk. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, my name is Susan Quirk. Uh, I'm gonna start on a little bit of a different note. I am the proud mom of two young girls. Uh, and I saw it on that note because uh, my role and why I'm here today is mainly because of my two young girls. Uh, I get up every morning uh, and I try to be the best role model I can be for my, for my two young daughters. And I take uh, all of the issues that are being discussed here uh, are issues that are relevant in my home life with my two young girls. Um, the, you know, the issues of implicit bias and diversity. And, and I need to start at home first because I think that uh, what makes me a good judge starts in my home and what I teach my own children and how I was raised uh, has brought me where I am, where I am today. So I, I start with my children and I, and I, I know that they're proud of me. I hope to continue to make them proud and I want to continue my career. And that's why I am here to elevate myself uh, to the Supreme Court. Um, and my daughters are my life, but I, I go into my courtroom every single day and I am in a juvenile delinquent court in family court dealing with other people's children. And I do not take that lightly. The, the, the um, children that are before me every single day are our future. Uh, they are the children of Brooklyn. And, and so I take the values uh, as if I'm dealing with my own children when each of these children appear before me every day. So uh, for the last four years, I was assigned to the Brooklyn Family Court Juvenile Delinquent Part as a, as a raise the age judge with the raise the age legislation. Uh, and hoping to keep uh, our children out of the criminal justice system, meaning to give them the services they need. And, and what I've learned there is that I am very lucky, my children are very lucky, uh, and we don't always realize uh, how good we have it because some of these children, although they come before me with a, you know, with a crime, you know, they haven't had uh, the, the services in the house, whether it be parental services or some of them uh, you know, living with their grandparents and, and the, the money, they don't have the, the financial needs and they're not going to school. There's so many services, so many issues that they're facing uh, every single day. And sometimes that is what has led them to my courtroom in the first place. So I hope every single day to uh, give them the services they need uh, and to make them productive members of society and not make them a statistic. And just as a little bit of a background, I was a prosecutor in the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. I was there for 16 years, but I started out as a paralegal and I went to law school at night. Uh, I left there in 2014 and I was a referee in Supreme Court and I was doing uh, mainly foreclosures, but all kinds of civil matters. I have, and then I was elected uh, in, after a contested primary out of Bushwick and Williamsburg. Uh, uh, I was elected to the bench and started in 2017. Uh, I love my job. I go to work every single day, grateful and honored uh, to be among colleagues here. And I hope to continue uh, that work in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Judge. I just wanna uh, circle back to the question, uh, are you, yes or, uh, yes or no, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? Oh yes, I, I apologize. I, uh, I am in agreement with my colleagues that as a sitting judge, um, I follow the law uh, as it is written. Uh, in response to the other question as far as politics and personal views that does not play a role uh, in my uh, decisions and the uh, judgments that I make every single day. And I just wanted to touch on if it's okay, um, District Leader Schneider's uh, comment because I, I did receive this uh, resistance when I ran in uh, 2016 and is that I only had a prosecutorial background. Uh, my, my entire 25 years of uh, service had been in public service, um, but as far as only having a prosecutorial background, um, 
you know, I, I, you do get resistance and I understand and I understand now with diversity and seeing, you know, uh, Judge Katanji Brown, it, it comes out everywhere and I'm not afraid to address it. And although I can't change my background, uh, it is what it is. I do want to say that as a prosecutor, I considered myself a gatekeeper of justice. So although uh, prosecutors prosecute, I also had the role of not uh, proceeding on cases that there were no merit. And I've had um, several cases where I actually dismissed the cases because the the, uh, the individual was, was innocent. And that was a part of a team effort of investigations uh, and me actively taking a role uh, and not just prosecuting. So um, and that's how much I can give to answer that uh, District Leader Schneider. So thank you. Judge, I just wanna, I really appreciate that. And just wanna say, um, I didn't mean to say in any respect uh, that uh, you know, pros you know that prosecutors are bad or prosecutors make bad judges. Uh, you know, there can be good. You know, prosecutors can make great judges and defense attorneys can make bad judges. There's just a lot fewer defense attorneys, particularly ones who work in indigent services. And I, I wanted to ask that question, but but for sure, uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, somebody with a prosecutorial background, obviously. Uh, being a, a judge and, and being a, an accomplished judge at that. I, I certainly wasn't meaning to uh, suggest that in any way, shape or form. Yeah, I, I, I didn't mean it like that either. I just, it is an issue and it's an issue that gets addressed not only on our level, you know, on, on, on the television level when we have Supreme Court justices, it is an issue and, and I understand it. And that's why I just wanted to address it. But I didn't take, I don't take what you mean offensively. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to ask the question uh, from the chat uh, from Dana. I'm going to mess up her last name. I apologize. I think it's uh, Raiklin. Rocklin? Rockland. Dana Rockland. Rockland. Uh, the incoming district leader uh, for AD50. Um, what percentage of the of young people that come before you receive a carceral outcome and what percentage of young people end up in diversion? I don't have actual numbers uh, to give you. That's uh, my role is to be on the bench every day and, and each case is individual. And I take that into account uh, based on the circumstances. Um, I don't, I, I guess as Judge Perlmutter said that I could get the numbers as far as stats from my administrative uh, judge. Um, but sitting on the bench for the last four years, the majority, and that's my goal. That's the goal of, uh, the whole raise the age legislation is to keep them out of, and it's not incarceration, it would be more of a, a non-secure detention facility or non-secure placement. So it's not an incarceration. Um, although it's, you know, it's a similar aspect, but the majority of cases are either diverted through probation and they don't even come before me because they already go through probation services. But if they do come before me because the case is referred, the majority of them uh, either receive a probation or uh, a servicing aspect, and that is the whole goal of Raise the Age. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, anyone else have any questions? Okay, uh, in the interest of time, Judge Burke, thank you so much uh, for your time uh, and also your answers uh, Q&A. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move us along to uh, Judge Sinceria P. Edwards. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you for this time and for everything that you do. I am Sinceria Edwards. I got a lot of um, different versions of my name, but it is Sinceria. I was born in Brooklyn. I have lived. Uh, by the time I was in the eighth grade, I'd went to six different public schools. So I probably lived in so many different neighborhoods in Brooklyn, which contributes to my diversity. Born in Brownsville, between Brownsville, East New York, lived in Fat, Flatbush, lived in Bushwick, lived in Crown Heights. And my uh, last stop as a kid was the um, projects. And when I went to the projects on Tompkins Avenue, I felt like George Jefferson, I was moving on up. So I am definitely Brooklyn uh, through and through. I have a lot of experience in the community. Let me tell you, I was, um, I'll give you my community service background first. I organized the Brooklyn chapter of the National Action Network. And I served four years as the president, as the president of National Action Network. I did a lot of foreclosure, deed theft, and housing programs. 
The reason I did it, because housing was very, very important to me as a child, something that um, sort of like shaped the way I moved and what I grew into life. I became a foreclosure attorney. I spent 12 years doing foreclosure work, saving a whole lot of homes because I was on the defense side. And then from there, I went to civil court. I was elected civil court in 2014. I spent my first two years in criminal court, which was a great experience. So for, although I didn't think it would be, but it was. I spent a lot of time doing bail because that's what you do in your first years of criminal court. From there, I spent five years almost on civil court. And in civil court, I spent a lot of time in the consumer debt, the no fault part. And after that, this January, I was appointing acting Supreme Court Justice and life is such a circle that I preside in the foreclosure part. So it's, um, and I'm told I'm doing extremely well. I'm moving the cases, I'm fair. Both parties understand me. And one of the things that I'm proud of that I do in that foreclosure part, anybody who's self-represented on every single call, I have a volunteer lawyers program. I give them the opportunity to speak with a defense attorney to see if they need representation. And what I would do is normally adjourn their cases so that they can put forth their best case possible because again, housing is important to me. So I am ready for any questions that you may have. And I'll, I forgot to tell you also, I'm a certified public accountant. I've spent my first 10 years in domestic and international banking, taxation, and mergers and acquisitions. So I have a very, very uh, diverse background, which really will serve well in Supreme Court. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Judge Sanria Edwards, I'm, uh, thank you for- That's okay. Uh, Just after four, after six o'clock, you can call me Sangria, my favorite drink. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I know you're talking to me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, just to ask the question, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? Now, I, I will say that as a sitting judge, I won't answer that question directly, but I can tell you when I was in criminal court, um, I know how important it is to really determine bail. The only reason for bail on the books is that to make sure that the defendant returns to court, right? and that there's no abuse and discretion um, in bail, and bail can be one-sided in some cases, and we know it. So when I sat in criminal court, I made sure that um, I didn't put anybody who shouldn't be in a bad situation with bail, where they'd have to spend time in Rikers Island, like Khalif Brada, and there's problems with spending time on Rikers Island. So I recognize that. I also did, I mean, they probably were sick of me complaining. Uh, when I was there, 2015 and 2016, there were too many arrests of young black and brown boys on the train and for some reason going to school, minor warrants where they in the park after dark. Remember, I lived in a project, so I know why you're in the park after dark, right? Sometimes you're cutting through. And so they release them and then they said, we wanna give them community service. Well, I don't think you should give them community service. That's demoralizing. They've already spent six or seven or eight hours sitting in jail, right? Because you've given them a warrant for jumping a turnstile and costing the city $3 and you're spending $500 a thousand on them for the day. So that's my position in terms of bill and I prefer not to uh, talk about it. And I also work with Dr. Johnny Ray Youngblood on a program called Safe Surrender that he developed with the DA's office, where we actually went into the churches and bought the courts in the churches, clear up all these minor warrants, smoking weed, riding a bike on the sidewalk, in the park, after dark, opening container, that too many people of color were getting disproportionately. So that's what I'll tell you about bail and what I did. And then after it's out of the legislation, then we can talk about it. 
Thank you so much. I I, uh, I know that we all appreciate your your co your context and and thought process behind it as much as you can share. So thank you. Thank Does you. anyone else have any questions for Judge Edwards? I sent everybody. Did y'all get my ten page bio? Okay. We did. Yeah, I I, I got your email. I, I assume everyone else did too. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Judge Edwards. Just in the interest of time, I, I'm gonna move us Jesse, along. Jesse, I, I have a a question. Quick question. Oh, please. I believe you're in, you said you do foreclosure, right? Yes. I'm, I'm um, the presiding floor, yes. foreclosure judge. God is good. I, I didn't think they would put me there because I figured my experience was too much and I was too heavy defense orientated, right? So I was going to ask you that. Uh, before you, before foreclosure, you were criminal? No, I was doing, uh, no, I was in criminal. That was, in my earlier career, 2015, 2016, I sat in criminal court, and then I moved to civil court, law civil, and I just now moved to uh, acting Supreme Court justice, where I do okay. foreclosure. And by the way, I would like to go to the appellate division because it's important who's making that law, all right? It is important. Thank you. And I like to write. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Okay, I wanted some more questions, but <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Judge Edwards, for your time today, and also for uh, sharing your thoughts on the on the questionnaire. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, we have Judge Richard Blasquez. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Right, we can hear you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I, first, I want to begin by uh, thanking you for the opportunity to meet with all of you. Uh, I, as it was mentioned earlier, besides all your day jobs, all the work that you put in as district leaders um, should be commended. M many people, perhaps in the community, don't know it's a non-paid position, but it's also a full-time position. So I just wanted to begin by thanking you for this opportunity. Um, I'm a 57-year-old I'm a uh, Latino man. I grew up in Lower East Side and I am the proud father of two children. I have one, my oldest son is a attorney with the Riverside Law Project in Manhattan. And my youngest son is a second year um, law, a student at Hunter College. I earned my uh, undergraduate degree at Baruch College in 1987. And I earned my JD degree at the City University of New York Queens College in 1992. I began my career as a solo practitioner in criminal and civil matters in, in 1993. In 1995, I transitioned into the public sector and began a decade-long career in the not-for-profit sector, specifically in the Bushwick community. Uh, from 1995 through 1998, I was the director of the housing organization for the Ridgewood Bushwick Housing uh, Senior Citizens Council. And I was also the founder and director of the first uh, Let Safe House program in Bushwick in Brooklyn, in, in, in essence. Uh, the Safe House program uh, provided temporary shelter to families with children who have been lead poisoned. And we removed them while their permanent apartments underwent uh, successful abatement procedures. Uh, the program was recognized as one of the most successful in New York State, after which I believe many other jurisdictions in the state started opening up lead Safe House programs for their children. In 1998, Oh, uh, realizing an urgent need for legal services in the Bushwick community, because at this time the Bushwick community had no legal services or legal aid provided in the in the in the community. Uh, we put together myself and a colleague. We put together a small grant uh, to provide legal services uh, to the uh, Bushwick and the surrounding community to prevent further evictions and a loss of housing and the loss of uh, uh, the housing stock that we had in place. The office, um, we opened our doors in 1998. And during the first six years, as, as I served as the director, we serviced and helped thousands of families maintain their affordable low-income housing and also maintain the existing housing stock. The, I'm happy to report that the office continues today doing this important work and they've actually expanded the service throughout all of Brooklyn and Queens. In November of 19, in November of 2005, I was honored 
with and privileged to be elected to the civil court bench, Kings County Civil Court. And I began my career in January of 2006. In November of 2008, I was elected to the Supreme Court in the second department. And just, I'm and sorry to interrupt. Uh, we are at time though, but please finish your, please feel free right. to finish your thought. I will do that. In the civil court, in essence, I've probably sat in every part of the court from the trial part to the mental hygiene part. I was appointed temporarily to cover for the surrogates um, court as well when there was an absence. I believe that my legal experience first as a practicing attorney for over 12 years, and now as a sitting judge for the past 16 years, combined with my, com my deep commitment to justice for all, are qualities that make me qualified for the continued position as judge of the Supreme Court. And I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Judge Velasquez. Uh, and a quick yes or no, uh, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? I think as some of my colleagues mentioned as a city judge, it would be inappropriate for me to comment at this time. Great, thank you. Uh, and I'll open it up for... Okay. Uh, I think just in the interest of time, we're, we're going to go ahead and, and move along. But uh, Judge Velasquez, I, I did want to thank you for your time here at the panel and, and also for submitting your questionnaire as well. We, we all really appreciate it. I want to thank you all. Thank you. thank you. Okay. And I know we haven't reached our break yet, so I appreciate everyone hanging with us. We're all doing a great job. Uh, okay, so next uh, we are moving over to sorry, just one second. Uh, Judge Lorna McAllister. Thank you all. Um, good evening to all the district leaders, to my colleagues, and to all who may be viewing us this evening. I want to thank the district leaders for inviting us to take part in this very uh, important forum. Um, I was elected in 2015, and I am now an acting Supreme Court Justice sitting in the matrimonial part in Brooklyn Supreme. Um, I was born and raised in the Bronx to parents of Jamaican descent who had very little education, but who supported my siblings and I in our endeavors to reach higher education. Uh, my parents instilled in us the importance of giving back to our community. As I sit, sit here and speak to you this evening about my efforts to elevate to Supreme Court, we know that this is a very complicated world and we are living in very troubled times. We have just emerged from a pandemic um, and we are still not out of the woods yet. Our communities are in crisis and many are in need of assistance. Our courts are a gateway through which many people will come to us for help. Um, as judges, we must be ready, willing, and able to assist people who come to us for help. Um, sitting in the matrimonial part, I can tell you that families are in crisis. My career in and out of the court system will demonstrate that I have had a wealth of experience in many areas of the law in which I have encountered people who are disenfranchised and in much need of help. I can assure you that if given the opportunity to elevate to Supreme Court, I will continue to serve the people of Brooklyn and will ensure that they receive the best judicial experience possible. And that's one in which they are treated fairly, respectfully, and with compassion. I'm a team player and I will work with my colleagues in collaboration with my colleagues to be sure that all the people of Brooklyn are served. I live in the community. I live in Crown Heights for over 24 years. I'm a part of the community. I have raised two children in this community and they have been taught the importance of giving back to their community. Making a difference to litigants um, is of the utmost importance to me. I do not now, 
nor have I ever in the last six years sitting on this bench have I taken the position for granted. I am confident that I have lived up to the professional expectations of a judge and I have served the people of Brooklyn with dignity, respect, and kindness. It is my hope that I will garner your support as I seek the position of Supreme Court Justice. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, uh, Judge McAllister. And a uh, quick yes or no, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? Majority of my uh, colleagues that I cannot comment on um, anything political or any uh, legislation that might be pending. Um, I do wanna say that um, when I was first elected in 2015, I was assigned to the criminal court. So I did sit in criminal court for two years and I continue to do arraignments because when you are appointed acting Supreme, you still have to sit in arraignments or about seven or eight times out of the year. So I do currently still sit in criminal court. And um, I just wanna say, you know, I understand the frustrations of bail reform and I understand, you know, what people are arguing about, but I cannot make a comment about it. I just can say that I do follow the law and um, that is something that I do on a continuous basis. Thank you so much. But does anyone else have any questions? I'll ask one very, very quickly. Um, first of all, Judge, I wanna, I wanna thank you and also just say that um, I really appreciated your, your, the answers to the, your answers to the questionnaire. Um, they really resonated with me um, and I really appreciated uh, those answers. One thing that I would love uh, a little bit more information on is um, the last question about increasing diversity. Um, uh, of of court staff of law clerk, um, you know, the law clerks um, uh, and, and court staff is a, 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 a you know how we build a bench of future judges, um, and so it's very important as we try to increase the uh, the judici you know diversity on the judiciary that we also increase diversity um, in the court staff uh, law clerks and and you know other court staff, and so I appreciate that you as a hiring person need to be completely neutral in that. But systemically writ large, how do you think that we can build more diversity uh, within the, um, the staff ranks so that we can then use that to build more diversity on the bench? You're on, you're on mute, Judge. That's weird, I don't, it did it by itself, that's really weird. <laughs> um, I think that um, training adds to that in terms of diversity, you know, implicit, implicit bias training, all of that comes together in terms of diversity and hiring diverse staff. Um, uh, every, that's why I feel judges need a lot more training in all areas of diversity. You know, I, I know I mentioned in my um, questionnaire one particular area that I feel we need training, but we need a, a whole host of training um, in terms of diversity, because I, I, I agree with you that we do need to have a more diverse staff as we look forward to people who may be ascending to the bench in the future, um, because we are having as I said, we have a large number of people coming before us in the courts who are disenfranchised people who need to see people who look like them um, and who can understand their situations and the crises that they are dealing with. And so this is something that we'll, I'm sure it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time, but I completely um, agree with it. We need it. Um, our courts need to be more diverse because Brooklyn is a very diverse borough. We have many different people coming before us. I sit in a part, I have people coming before me from all walks of life, Russian, Chinese, Asian, everywhere, all walks of life. Um, and people need to see people who look like them, understand them, 
And so we need to really increase the diversity in that respect. Thank you for that answer. Thank you so much, uh, Judge McAllister. I'm gonna go ahead and, and move us along, but I very much appreciate that uh, your time today. Thank you. Uh, and uh, last in our first group, in our first group is uh, Judge uh, Dwayne Paul. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much to the district leaders for this opportunity. Uh, thank you for the, to the community who came out to take the time to listen and learn more about us. Um, I am currently a Kings County Civil Court judge um, seeking your nomination to Supreme Court. My journey, if you will, uh, to this moment started very many years ago. My first exposure to the court system, to the justice system was when I was an adolescent. I had um, an older brother. He went on a youth trip. He got in an accident and he passed away. And as a result of that, it prompted a wrongful death lawsuit in Supreme Court and a custody case in family court as my parents tried to figure out the best way to raise me. Um, and that left a lasting impression on me. Uh, I understood very young how important it was to have an advocate, a voice in the courtroom. And I understood what it meant to have a judge who understood the community and how important their decisions are on everyday people. Um, and so from that, I, um, as I, you know, my first assignment as a judge was actually in family court. And so life turned full circle as a young person being in the court system and my family in the court system, I had the privilege of giving back to families and communities in the way that the court system gave to me and my family. Um, you know, I watched families reunite. I watched and supported and provided resources to uh, family members who were facing drug and alcohol as they were trying to rehabilitate themselves and put their family back together again. Um, I helped with domestic violence cases and uh, reinforcing and providing protection to members of the community. And I was in Supreme in family court for four years and as an acting Supreme Court justice. And now I'm in civil court. Um, I spend a great deal of time during the pandemic as, as a civil court judge working with um, everyone between small mom and pop business owners who were struggling to make ends meet during the pandemic and landlords who were uh, struggling to, to pay the mortgage and to keep the property and finding creative innovative ways for them to work together to overcome and, and survive through the, the phases of the pandemic. Uh, before I became uh, a judge, the work that I did when I started as an attorney was predominantly in civil court. Um, and when I ended my legal career, the most of the work that I did was in Supreme Court. I represented individuals, small businesses, large corporations, um, doing personal injury, property damage, product defect, um, intentional torts, uh, a, a myriad of cases that are predominantly in the Supreme Court. Uh, but even as my work as an attorney, I never forgot uh, what it was like for my family to go through the court system and for myself as a young child. And so I was the director of community service for the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. I sat on community board three. I did different um, programs and workshops, such as um, starting the community law day, which became now an annual uh, event where attorneys come out, they volunteer their time to give free legal guidance and information to the community on all areas of the law. I put together different clinics involving uh, trusts and estates and elder, elder law clinics. Hi, hey, Judge, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're, we're at time, but please finish your thought. And so, my commitment to the justice system is longstanding. I would be uh, privileged to continue the work that I'm doing now, uh, but as a Supreme Court judge. And you had a, a follow-up question um, as it relates to rolling back bail reform. As a sitting judge, uh, I 
I'm in a position to apply the law, but not comment on the law. Um, I think forums like this are so important because the legislators are there in partnership to write the law. Um, and it's our duty and, and my duty to apply the law as it's written. And I will do so. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'll, I'll open up the floor to other questions. I'm gonna have to make something up. Uh, I did have a question. Um, uh, in, in, I was reading your questionnaire. Uh, thank you so much for, for filling it out on. Um, you had commented on uh, what you created a, a handy resource guide of community-based organizations for pro bono legal assistance. Um, is that something do you think uh, that should be created more universally uh, in the justice system? Or is that something that you did yourself as a judge uh, on, the bet on the bench? So I, I put that together. Um, what I did was I took a compilation of different uh, handouts um, and lists that had outlined community-based organization and made it available for litigants in the courtroom. Um, we have a help center in civil court on the fourth floor. They have handouts there. So I went there and I collected from that court. And when I was in family court, there were some handouts there. So I make them available in the courtroom. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Julio. Thank you, Judge Paul. Any other questions? Ah, Sammy has his hand raised. Thank you, Judge Paul, for coming and for sharing the story about your experience with your mother and, and your family and your uh, siblings and, and growing up. My question is related to the press reports um, while you were running for surrogate that uh, talk about the, the employment lawsuit. Is there anything, an update that you would like to share about that, um, given that that case was settled instead of and its course? Is there anything that you would like to say regarding that lawsuit and how can we have confidence on, on the integrity or, or the accusations raised in that lawsuit? Yeah, thank you for the question, I appreciate it. I think it's a couple of things that are important. I think, um, and you've seen from the responses today, there are so many limitations that judges have. You know, as a judge, we've elected to give up our public voice. Um, and in exchange for the privilege of being able to write decisions and impact lives every day. And I will say that there, you know, what's in a, what a journalist is permitted to write is far different from what a jurist and what a judge is allowed to do. And the justice system is designed so that judges and parties who come before judges have the right to have an unbiased, open-minded judge from the beginning of the case until the end of the case. And so while you petitioners or plaintiffs are permitted to come to the court freely and write anything that they want in a complaint, but it's up to a jurist to create the open mind and space until all of the evidence is before the court before making a decision. Um, what I know about that process is that, and, and to answer the question, the second portion of the question is, how can the community have um, confidence in myself as a judge when people come before me? It's because in me, you will have a jurist who understands how important it is to have someone who is unbiased and open and will wait to hear every piece of evidence before a decision is made. And so what happens in the media should not be a parallel to what happens in our justice system. And so in me, you can be confident that you'll have someone who will hear all of the facts and all of the information from all of the parties before rendering a decision.
Thank you, Thank Judge you. Paul. Uh, I very much uh, appreciate your your answer and your your frankness and your clarity and your and your response. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for uh, being here with your time and, and also answering the questionnaire. And of course, uh, that goes for all of our candidates and participants in the in this process. I, I believe we have reached um, our pause, Julio. Yes, uh, we're going to take a, a short break uh, to allow folks to use the restroom, um, get a glass of water, and we'll be back in, a, in about five minutes. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're going to get us back started in the second portion of the um, e forum. Uh, we are just a wee bit behind schedule, uh, but we'll try to get us back um, on time. And we appreciate everyone's patience this evening. I know it's going to be a long one, but uh, we definitely appreciate everyone's commitment this evening. District Leader um, Peña, can I make a suggestion, please? Sure. Um, and for those district, uh, those judges that have already, um, I'm going to ask the rest of the leaders, but for the judges that have already um, went through the, their interview, do they have to stay on or can they, um, can they log off? They are welcome to stay on. Uh, if they like, they can uh, be moved as an attendee, but they're welcome to stay on. Okay, but they're what they can log off if they choose to. Sure. Okay, thank you. Yes, it's not required that you stay on. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Julie. Oh, no, I was gonna say we're just gonna uh, move on to our first um, uh, judge in our, our second panel, uh, uh, Judge Robin Garson. Good evening. Um, I just have to apologize ahead of time. I have found someone to walk my very injured old dog and that doorbell may ring in a minute. So it'll take a second to let the dog out. Hi, good evening. So why am I here and why am I seeking an elected spot on the Supreme Court? Because I'll cut to the chase. I'm going to be 70 years old next year. I have and I will have forced retirement. I have been an acting Supreme Court justice for 11 years. I've been an elected civil court judge for nearly 20. Uh, unless the sky falls in and Democrats lose our elections in November here in Brooklyn, I am looking forward to being reelected to civil for a 10 year term, but I will only be permitted to serve one year of it. Um, as an acting Supreme Court justice, I was actually assigned to civil court for most of that time. I ran a mediation program that I created and presided over in the Supreme Court building, but I also sat in the civil court building. And for a very short time at the end of last year, I was actually assigned to both buildings. Um, over the years, I have sat in criminal court for arraignments and I continue to do that several times a year. At the beginning of my tenure, uh, when housing court and civil court were under one supervisory administration, I handled housing court matters as well. I sit in the civil term and I'm told that I'm good at what I do and I'm confident that I've grown over the years and I do think I do a good job and I'm not ready to retire. I've seized opportunities. This is, give one second, I am so sorry. Let me just get up and hand the dog out the door. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Come, 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 come. Okay. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Judge, I think all of us with four-legged friends or who appreciate four-legged friends are, are here and for he's you. A, so. I appreciate it. He's also a little drug addict. So you know what he wants, he wants. Um, as I was saying, I've, I've created opportunities to do things beyond the bench. I think I always wanted to go to law school because I was interested in criminal justice issues. And before I went to law school, I edited social action in the law. I participated in an amicus brief on one of two death penalty cases in New York in the 70s, and I ran the first jury study in the country to use live jurors. Then I went to law school, and when I graduated from law school, 
I didn't practice criminal law. Those opportunities just weren't there for me at that time. I did not practice personal injury. I did employment law. I did commercial law. I liked that transactional kind of work. But I did some pro bono work also, elder law. And I did practice that for a small time, for a short time. I was a volunteer election lawyer for candidates that I believed in, including candidates who were supported by several people on this call, uh, district leaders and a, and a judge who's on this call. Uh, and so I pursued that. And then I was actually drafted. I did not seek a judgeship. It was not what I expected to do. I was involved in the Brooklyn Bar Association as a bar leader. I served as a director and trustee. I still am very involved as a section chair. I had projects that, I, that were very important to me. And I had no desire to give up my First Amendment rights. I think I'm out of time. But I was yeah. asked to run. I was asked to run, and I'll tell you about that if you ask me the right question. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Uh, just quick yes or no. Uh, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? Like my colleagues, I whether the letter of the law would permit an answer or not, I don't think it's appropriate, and I'm not going to answer it. What I will say, however, is that in light of whatever happens with our bail system, I think that our legislative uh, leaders need to be very cognizant that we need money in the budget so that when we don't have the ability to set bail or even when we do that we have support services for people who may or may not belong in the criminal justice system who may or may not belong on rikers island or who may or may not belong out in the community without any safeguards and that takes money it takes money for trained psychologists to do psych evaluations. It takes money for the criminal justice agencies that do the evaluation that judges like me in part rely on when we, when we decide whether or not someone qualifies for supervised release or some other safeguard when we're letting somebody walk out. The worst, the, I have to tell you that the least fun part of my job is sitting in criminal court in terms of the following. It's the most immediately consequential. While civil justice is important, what goes through my mind and has gone through my mind for 11 years is, am I letting the wrong person out and am I putting the wrong kid in and ruining his life? That is what I usually mean by merely being a human being or merely being human. And those are things that play out. And I think that one of the things we need to address is that we need experienced jurors, jurors sitting in arraignment courts. And that's not usually what happens. We need people who are not afraid of newspaper coverage or what the court clerks think or what the court officers think or what either the prosecuting office thinks or the defense attorney. It has to be someone who has enough confidence and experience to evaluate what's right before him or her. Thank you, Judge. Uh, any other questions? Okay. I think just in the interest of time, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to keep moving us along. Uh, but uh, Judge Garson, thank you so much for your time here today and also for the responses and the questionnaire. Thanks. Uh, I, have a I, I have a request. I sent a letter to most most people, most of the district leaders, or maybe all district leaders on this call, and I don't mind and would even encourage you to share the letter that I had written because I think it gives a pretty concise view of who I am and why I do it. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity, okay. everyone. Thank you. I'm sure we can make that public. Uh, I've, okay, next we have uh, Judge Christopher Robles. I, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that too, Robles. Uh, no, you didn't. Uh, sorry, let me get my camera going. Uh, this computer. Okay, can you all see me? Yep. And hear me, and hear me as well. Yes. Yep. You're good. Oh, oh, okay, great. So I just want to start by thanking all of you, district leaders and delegates and everyone else that's listening to uh, all of us, because this is such an important uh, program. And um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, be here to answer your questions and introduce myself and speak a little bit about what I've done and why I wanna become a Supreme Court judge. So my career path is a little bit different than some of the other stories you've heard here today. Um, 
I, I was born and raised in uh, Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Lived, lived in Brooklyn my whole life. I was raised by a single mom. Uh, we really didn't have much. Uh, we were always uh, on the verge of losing housing, um, not having a lot to eat and not having a lot of things. But, um, you know, we, ma we made it through. We made it through. And I always wanted to give back to the community. Community service is very important to me. So I, I'm a public school graduate. I went to CUNY Law. I'm a CUNY Law School graduate, which uh, the motto of the school is law uh, in the service of human needs. I think I'm saying that right. And when I graduated law school, I never worked for government. I went right into private practice. I had a community office back in Sunset Park where I grew up and I serviced all kinds of people, black, brown, Latinos, um, I'm Puerto Rican. It was important for me to go back into that community and give back and did a lot of pro bono work in the community. I did every kind of case imaginable from bankruptcy to criminal law, to family court. I've represented a lot of domestic violence survivors. Um, I've done a lot of appellate work. I've uh, represented 50 different um, appeals. I was a uh, primary counsel on, I had a pretty good reversal rate. So um, I've done that. I was on the uh, Sunset Park uh, Business Improvement District, which if you don't know is an organization most neighborhoods have one where they, you know, allocate funds to uh, benefit the community, whether we're doing a street fair or something that's beneficial to the community. Also a board member of the uh, Puerto Rican Bar Association. I'm proud of that work. We do a lot of advocacy work. We also do scholarships for needy um, law school uh, attendees. I also received the Star Brooklyn Award in the newspaper from The Spectator which um, they highlighted a lot of the work that I was doing in the community. I was a small claims arbitrator, a member of the Latino Judges Association. Um, I'm involved with donating turkeys to needy families um, during Thanksgiving. And that's something I've been doing for a long time. I have student interns. I'm a board member of the Sunset Park Health Council, which is a collaboration with uh, NYU Langone. What we do is set up medical facilities in um, areas that are underserved, like Red Hook, Sunset Park, there's some in Bay Ridge, and they're continuing to expand. Like I said, I'm a lifelong resident. Um, I judge, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, we're at time, but if you could just finish your thought. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that I, I bring a wealth of experience uh, because a lot of the people that come into, people that come in that users of the court system are many times uh, people that are down on their luck and have a tough time. And I can relate to a lot of their stories because growing up, I've uh, walked those shoes. So I hope that gives you uh, a good picture of, of, of the kind of work that I've done and my qualifications. And I've sat in every, every part in the courthouse. I've been a judge for five years in criminal court and every single part that we have trials, arraignments, I've sat in every one. Uh, alternative to incarceration, youth part, drug part, felony wave apart. I've, I've done all the parts and I'm really uh, think that I'm, I'm ready to uh, go to the next step. So, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Judge, for your time here. Uh, and a quick yes or no, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? Well, as, as you've heard all my comments, and it's, it's unfortunately something that you know, judges really can't comment on, so I'm going to also not comment specifically on that, but I will tell you that when, when I'm doing bail, when I'm list, list, doing arraignments and thinking about bail, first of all, I never lose sight that I'm making a decision about whether somebody can go home or not. And I don't take that lightly. And I think every judge, when you make these orders, you have to be humble and recognize that. I would say, you know, bail is not black and white. Sometimes there's a case that you might say, hey, maybe bail's appropriate on this case, but there's also something called supervised release which is appropriate and I use often. And there's also something called the unsecured bond. What that means is you're setting bail, but the person who you're setting bail on is able to be released without having to put any money down. They're signing a promise that they're gonna come back to court. And if they don't come back to court, they will be a judgment against them. And I think that is an important tool, especially when it's a close call and you have somebody before you that doesn't have cash bail. So that's another tool. 
in the toolbox. There are many tools that could be used to secure uh, someone's return to court. And I'm not shy about using that because it accomplishes the person getting home and it accomplishes uh, some sort of a, a, a security that they're gonna return to court. Got it. Uh, thank you for the context and your response. Uh, I'll just open it up if there are any other questions. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm gonna move it. Oh, Sammy has in the nick of time. Uh, Sammy. Um, thank you, Piers. Um, good evening, Judge Robles. Um, I'm very curious. Thank you for filling out the questionnaire. Um, in the in the question about pro se litigants that self you know defend themselves, um, you mentioned that you advise them or kind of explain why it's like a bad decision. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Um, I'm just like thinking about someone who is like sure that they really want to defend themselves. Um, is that based on uh, you know, what you have seen the experience on the results or the outcomes of people that uh, defend themselves. Um, could you elaborate more about that? Right. Well, th thank you so much for that question. So just to very quickly uh, put in context, when somebody wants to represent themselves in a criminal case and the judge finds that they knowingly, voluntarily decide they want to waive attorney, the court has no choice but to allow them to represent themselves. That is a constitutional uh, case law that you have to do that. But what's also true is you have to do a searching inquiry. So you have to ask a lot of questions. What's your education? What's your experience? Why do you wanna represent yourself? A lot of times that I found people wanna represent themselves because they're not happy with their attorney. When I have that situation, I assign them another attorney. Uh, if they if that's what they want, I really try to let them be aware that there are so many pitfalls in representing yourself, because the judge has to hold you to the same standard as a lawyer. I cannot give you legal advice. That's the law that I ha I I've sworn to uphold, and I follow the law as it's uh, written and as the appellate courts have told me that I have to. But I also want to make sure that somebody accused of a crime is having their constitutional rights protected. So before I will allow somebody to uh, represent themselves, I wanna make sure that I make every effort I can to explain to them the consequences, to try to work with them, get a different lawyer, or in the alternative, I, I try to assign them a legal advisor. And I also tell them that if you change your mind at any time, I will allow you to have a lawyer. Thank you. Absolutely. Very helpful. Uh, thank you, Sammy. Uh, thank you, Judge Robles. Uh, and uh, just in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and, and move us along. But I appreciate you being here and also your responses on the in the questionnaire. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next up. Uh, oh, and I do. I just want to acknowledge uh, some questions in the chat in terms of the questionnaires. Uh, thank you, Melinda and others who have asked about that. Uh, I think Doug put in the link there uh, for all the candidates questionnaires and, and please feel free to reach out um, if you need uh, that information or, or any other information uh, regarding candidates responses. Uh, next up we have Judge Cheryl Gonzalez. Good evening everyone and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to participate in this forum. Uh, just a little bit about my background. I immigrated to New York from Trinidad at the age of 16 and I entered college then. After college, I started to pursue a graduate degree in counseling. And then there were two events that really shaped the direction that my life took and why I entered the, the legal profession. I worked at a halfway house for people who were formerly um, in mental institutions and we tried to unionize and they fired all of us. Um, there was nothing we could do about it. Um, 
my next job, I worked for the state with um, youth who were placed in uh, facilities. Uh, and we, I was a provisional for many years, took the exam, I passed, but many people didn't. So we were able to get the Puerto Rico Legal Defense Fund to represent us and file a federal lawsuit that the um, test was not related to the, um, the, the job. It, the, what they tested for was not what the job required. We got a state a settlement and um, I, I understood the impact of the law then. And I think that that's when I decided to go to law school. Um, I saw how people were able to keep their jobs and, and it, it was very important for a lot of people. I, then I started out in private practice doing family law wills and some real estate. I became a law clerk um, shortly after that, and I worked in civil, criminal, and Supreme Court. I was appointed to housing court in 2005. I became a supervising judge in 2015. And being a judge is a rewarding experience because I'm able to use the law to uh, make a positive difference in people's lives. There are times when the law does not permit certain outcomes, but when litigants who appear before me are treat, uh, realize they're being treated with respect and they uh, have an opportunity to be heard, they walk away understanding why there is a particular outcome. And, and that's important that I, people who walk out of the courtroom are not blindsided. And I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't use that term. I just did a CLE and of people with disabilities and I, I have to check myself off. <laughs> They, they walk away not understanding what happened. But um, I think that the, the, the ultimate goal is to make sure that people understand. And even if they don't get what they want, they, they can be really, um, satisfied that there was justice. Um, as a judge, I'm also able to work for, use the position for the benefit of others. Uh, as the chair of the Women in Prison Committee of the National Association of Women Judges, we have been able to accomplish a great deal. We've um, supported legislation with uh, permission from the Ethics Committee to an um, anti-shackling bill, Medicaid sus suspension bill, and we visited um, various Danbury and uh, Metropolitan Detention Center to uh, talk about the conditions there. Um, and I humbly ask you for your support for my um, bid to become a Supreme Court judge. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judge, and a, a good reminder for all of us on able bodied language. So I, I appreciated you catching yourself. It's a good reminder for me. So thank you. Uh, and a quick uh, yes or no uh, Are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? I, I can't comment on that, as everybody said. It was, but it's been tweaked twice. So uh, I think it, it will change. I think there's a strong possibility that it will. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'll, I'll open the floor for anyone else. Okay, I think, uh, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and, and move us along slowly in the in the interest of time. But uh, Judge Gonzalez, thank you so much for submitting your questionnaire and for sharing space with us tonight. Very much appreciate your your responses and, and time. Thank you. And uh, thank you. And uh, I'll move over to uh, Judge Robin Shears. Good evening. I just like to thank everybody. I, I think a forum is a very good way to um, understand who we are as judges but I would pray that you all would answer our letters, our calls, so you could meet us individually, visit our courts, so you could know who, I, who we are. So who is Robin K. Shears? Robin as in Batman, K is in the color, is K is for Kelly, and Kelly Green, Shears as in pink and Shears, like Shears, like the scissors, but spelled totally differently. But I am born on an island, the island of Manhattan, Harlem, USA. I moved to Brooklyn when I was six years old and it was 10 of us, eight children and two parents. So I always say to God be the glory. And I say that because 
it was 10 of us, but it was only one bathroom. And now I have my own bathroom. So I do say that everywhere I go because it's the small things that count. So I just remember being in the third grade, eight years old. And for whatever reason, I was not in school. I was in a courthouse in a, in a family, in a housing court case. And I just said, I could be a judge. And not because I knew the law, it was because the housing court judge was not listening. And I remember distinctly everything he said, the same thing for every case. And I was like, no way, no way. He's not listening. He's not listening. And that's the biggest part of a judge's job. We listen and we have to hear the facts and discern the facts and apply it to the law. And I think we do a great job at that. So that's who I am. I'm a listener. I really know how to listen. I know people think I talk a lot, but I really listen more than I talk. And so I've been in the court system for over 30 years. I started as a court attorney in landlord tenant court. And then I went to work for a civil court judge and then I went to work for another civil court judge and then that judge went to Supreme. So actually I worked in every court in the court system except for a surrogate's court. And it's, I mean, not in surrogate's court and family court. But as soon as I became a judge, they put me in family court. So now I work in every court except for surrogate's court. I also worked in every borough not always as a judge and not always as a court attorney. And I had a part-time judge, part-time job. They allowed us to be administrative law judges. And I was administrative law judge for the parking violations bureau at the time. Now they call it the department of finance It's all lumped in. So I know diversity when I see it, when I hear it, when I smell it, when I taste it and when I feel it, because this New York city is very diverse in every borough is very different. And every borough does not have the same laws, right? So sometimes if you're sitting in Manhattan, the first district, and you come back to Brooklyn in the second, you have to know those things. You have to know those things. I'm now an acting Supreme Court justice. I've been that for twice. So one time is you call the hybrid. So you stay in civil court and you do civil and Supreme. Then now, now I'm a full and I'm in the Supreme Court building at 360 Adams Street. And I've already sat in several parts and prior to- Hi Judge, I'm sorry to interrupt uh, but we're at time. If you could please finish your thought. Okay, so now y'all think I really know how to talk a lot but I really do listen more than I talk, okay? So I just wanna say, I thank you this evening and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. It's your time to use, so I uh, appreciate you. Uh, you're introducing yourself to us. Uh, quick yes or no, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? I am in support. I'm not answering that question because you know that we can't. But what I am in support of, I'm in support of, as Judge Gonzalez said, this has been tweaked more than enough times. I am support of stakeholders that know what needs to be done to be at the table. I am support of people who are talking about rolling back and doing things and what bail reform is to really explain what bail, bail is for. And I think the public needs to know that. And I think that's what's missing. Thank you so much. I, I uh, again, I, I know that I said that a version of this before, but even not being able to comment on it as a sitting judge, I appreciate um, the context that, that folks have shared. And I think it being a, a very current and relevant topic uh, in our times and in our city and state, and we really appreciate you, everyone's uh, uh, experience, thoughts on the on the topic. So I'll, I'll go ahead and open up the floor for other questions. There's a question in the Q and A from Janice Henderson. Um, when you research your opinion, is there a law librarian as part of your research team? When you research your opinions, well. I have a court attorney and my court attorney assists me most times on things, but I've been in the court system a long time, a very, over 30 something years. So there's a lot of stuff that I know and we just, we have lead, continual legal education. So I keep abreast of the law, but no, it's not a law librarian. It's a court attorney and myself. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Emil. Thank you, Janice. Uh, anyone else? Sam, you just hopped off. Mute, do you have a question? And can I just say this on my questionnaire for some reason, question number 12 got deleted, but I answered it when I sent in my, uh, I sent it in in the email. So the answer is there. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, we'll, uh, I think we'll follow up if we, if we're missing anything, but uh, just in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and and move us along, uh, but uh, Judge Robin K. Shears, I, I did, didn't want to leave out the K. It's an important uh, yep. initial there. My parents yes. eight kids and gave us both names, a first name and a middle name. So they took time with those yep. names. <laughs> yep, Thanks. of course. Well, th thank you so much uh, for your time yeah. with us today. And I'll go ahead and, and shift this over to Judge Rachel Fryer. Hi. Can you hear me? I think I was not next on the list, but I'm ready to uh, to begin. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you all so much for giving me this opportunity. I'm going to try as best as I can to consolidate three years of my life experience in about three minutes, if that's what you'd like me to do. Um, I was born and raised in the Hasidic community in, in Borough Park. I actually was born in Crown Heights, but raised in Borough Park. Um, all my life, I've been raised uh, to follow the tradition in the, in the Hasidic community. And I was taught that to remain true to our values, we weren't going to participate in higher education. So I graduated high school and I became a legal secretary after taking a legal stenography course in my senior year. And I thought that would be the highest um, I would ever reach professionally. But when I turned 30, um, there's this voice in me said, I have to do more. I've been working for lawyers that are now are younger than me, and I really want to do more. Um, it, was a big, it was a big watershed in my life, and um, I made my deal with God. Please help me get through higher education and law school without compromising my values. And if that happens, I become a lawyer, dear God, I'll help your children. And God wasted no time in testing me. I got involved in advocating and defending youth at risk in my community. I started projects for them. I helped them get GEDs. And I've learned that these boys were not bad boys. They were making bad choices because they've been through trauma. And shortly after that, I got involved with advocating for women in my community who were being discriminated against because they wanted to enter the world of emergency medical services. And I realized that these women had no voice. And again, I realized I had to take a stand for these women. But what I realized was it wasn't just about helping women. It was becoming part of what they were trying to do. I became an EMT and then a paramedic. And I still continue today to volunteer as a paramedic. I'm on shift every night and on weekends, I drive the ambulance and I respond to all emergencies. And I've learned how important it is to continue and to volunteer. I also volunteered when I was um, an, an attorney in private practice for the Access to Justice Program. I spent much time in family court. Um, I was part of the um, family um, attorney program for volunteer attorneys and that was started by Chief Justice Judith Kay. I was assigned to Queens Family Court, Brooklyn Family Court, as well as Manhattan Family Court. I could say that my volunteer work has really been such a big part of my life by seeing what a difference I could make by being a legal professional. And um, that was really what springboarded me into running for civil court in 2016. Um, it, was, it was a race that everyone said was never going to happen. And in fact, that was really the journey of my life. Naysayers every step of the way saying it's never going to happen, it's never going to happen. But I did win in 2016. I became the first Hasidic woman who ran for public office. Hi, Judge. I'm sorry to interrupt. We're at time, but please finish your thought. 
Okay, and it was, it's my privilege to be able to hear, to speak with you tonight about why I want to become a Supreme Court judge and use my experience for the greater people and for the, and the higher court. Thank you so much. And a quick yes or no, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? I'm going to follow with my, as with my colleagues before me and not answer that question, but refer to my first two years in criminal court doing arraignments. When I looked at these young defendants, I looked them in the eye and I saw the same pain that I saw in the youth at risk that I counseled. I would tell them the same thing I spoke to the kids that I counseled. You have to believe in yourself. You can change your past so you can change your future. And I've had grown men cry in my courtroom and they would say, Judge, no one ever spoke to me like that before. I feel there's so much that we as judges can do to really make a difference in these defendants' lives. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and are, are there any other questions on the floor? There's a, a question in the Q&A from Victoria Messina uh, for Judge Frere. Uh, please tell us about a recent uh, diversity, equity, inclus inclusion, or racial justice training that you attended and what you got out of it. So we have as judges these different courses that are given. Most of the time they're given during our lunch break and they're given on platforms like Zoom. Um, what I've learned is, is that there's so much about different communities that we can benefit from by just speaking and having open dialogue. I've attended all of these programs as well as when we get together at our judicial seminars, we have the same type of ideas. We have different programs for the judges. So I've learned that we all come from different communities and different backgrounds, but there's so much more that binds us than what divides us. And so much that we can share when we actually open ourselves up and share our own background, how much we learn from other people as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge. And uh, if we don't have any other questions, just in the interest of time, I'm going to move us along. But very much appreciate you being here with us and also uh, taking the time to fill out the questionnaire. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you all for all the work that you do, District Leader. Uh, okay, great. And uh, we're going to be, and appreciate everyone who has uh, stuck with us, and uh, including the judges in the in the second half. Uh, of the of the forum, so we're going to move along to Stephen Bursio. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, a Please, bit of technical difficulties. So my name is Steve Berzio. Uh, I'm an attorney. I've been an attorney for over 18 years. Um, I want to thank the district leaders um, and the other uh, the judicial delegates who are uh, watching this uh, for, for helping to organize this and being part of the democratic process. Um, as I said, uh, I'm currently an attorney. I'm a law clerk for a state Supreme Court judge in Brooklyn. I've held that position now for a bit over 10 years, about 10 and a half years. Uh, prior to that, I uh, represented tenants primarily. Um, I did do some foreclosure defense work, but I represented tenants in housing court uh, for about uh, seven years. Uh, I did that in Williamsburg and Bushwick. In fact, uh, Judge Velasquez, who appeared uh, before, was my first supervising attorney. Um, and that was in late 2004. Um, I had the honor to work with him. And after he left and, and became a judge, I stayed there uh, for many years. And I had an incredible experience there. I represented tenants in Williamsburg and Bushwick, uh, defended them against evictions, um, and uh, was able to really learn a great deal about those communities, uh, that area of the law. As some of you probably know, it's a bit of a baptism by fire uh, when you do legal services work or indigent defense work. It wasn't criminal defense work. Um, as a law clerk for a state Supreme Court judge, um, I am sort of part research assistant, part chief of staff. 
Uh, I am the principal uh, law clerk. We have an assistant law clerk. Um, we've been in several different parts. We started out the first year in 2012 in the city part, 2013 in the mental hygiene part, uh, 2014 and 2015, we were in uh, the matrimonial part uh, researching. It was a very new experience for me, uh, researching areas relating to custody, uh, equitable distribution. And so since then, uh, for uh, the last uh, six years now, uh, we have been in the general part uh, dealing with civil matters, uh, negligence cases, uh, business uh, disputes, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I, I want to say I've, I've been listening in for the entirety of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, forum, and it is a great event. Uh, one thing I do want to add, though, is, you know, I, I know that this is primarily this is a, a candidates forum for for Supreme Court candidates. And I was found qualified by both this for civil court and Supreme Court by the Kings County Judicial Screening Committee. But after careful thought and consideration, and although I have been found qualified for both of those positions, uh, I will only be seeking a nomination for the position of civil court judge if that position becomes available. And so I just wanna say thank you all uh, for your hard work, uh, your time tonight, uh, I will answer any questions if, if you feel like any questions should be asked. Um, and I just want to say, you know, how proud I am uh, that we do have, uh, you know, such a diverse uh, and, and, and just really a considerate uh, group of, of, of leaders here in Brooklyn. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, it was just in the interest of, I appreciate you sharing about your your considerations and, and what you plan to put yourself forward for. I think just for everybody's edification, uh, quick yes or no, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? Well, given that this is, you know, a candidate forum, I think that uh, the qualifications that, that the prior uh, candidates um, have uh, described uh, I'm going to follow them, um, and I'm going to answer in the same way that, that you know, legislatures uh, pass legislation. Uh, but I would say, you know, that it is important, uh, this process of, 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 of arraignments and, and bail uh, it, it is an incredibly uh, important um, process for, for judges to, to consider. Uh, as Judge Perlmutter had said initially, it is a, a very important area for those judges that are dealing with these changes, you know, these changes year after year, uh, to, to stay abreast of the changes and, and to, to be informed about those other options they have, um, such as, uh, you know, uh, providing the folks that come before you with uh, mental health services or other sort of uh, alternatives. But thank you for asking that. Thank you so much. Uh, I, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead and, and move us along, but I appreciate you you being here with us and thank I'm you. sure that it'll be useful for folks to read your, your questionnaire in, in any civil court uh, search. Uh, okay, uh, so moving us to Judge Craig Walker next. Good evening, everyone. And thank you again uh, for everyone taking the time out. I know the hour is late and it's a Sunday evening, but again, thank you all for doing this very important work. Um, I'm gonna start at the end rather than the beginning. Uh, I'm currently the presiding judge for the youth part in uh, Brooklyn Supreme Criminal Term. I've been doing that now for four years since 2018, August, 2018, based on raise the age legislation. So I've been doing the work of a Supreme Court uh, justice uh, for four years now, currently in my 10th year on the bench. Um, why is all that important? Well, let me go back to the beginning now. I was born here in Brooklyn. Um, when I got to high school, I was really not doing the things that I should be doing. I, I was um, bending to peer pressure. And so I was 
cutting class. I was doing things that I'm not very proud of right now. And it put me on a very bad path uh, to the point where my parents signed me into the military at 17. Uh, the Navy changed my life. It saved my life. It gave me direction, gave me purpose. I did three tours uh, to include Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield uh, in the enlisted uh, ranks. Uh, but then I focused on, on law. I took uh, my undergrad classes at night and on the weekends while I was in the military. And then I you know, went through, uh, I, I practiced um, landlord tenant. I did a lot of civil litigation. My whole background was civil litigation. I had the opportunity to work for a civil court judge as a, a court attorney. And then lo and behold, people started asking me, well, Craig, when are you going to run to become a judge? I never thought about that. Never thought I could be a judge. I was the first person in my family to be an attorney. Um, but I, I went ahead and I, I ran with it and I was elected. Next thing I know, I'm, I'm put in criminal court with no criminal experience. Uh, and it was, it was frightening. Uh, what did I do? I went right over to Court Street to the Barnes and Noble there, got every single book on criminal law and taught myself because it was very important to me to be prepared because I knew I had people's lives in my hand. And why is that important now? Because alternatives to incarceration is what I'm all about. I sat in the parts which were not the parts people wanted to sit in. I sat in the mental health, I sat in the substance abuse. And because people knew that I was in the military, they started saying, well, judge, you know, my, my client is a, is a veteran, you know? And I said, well, why don't we have services for veterans in, who are committing misdemeanors and violations? That, those were the majority of people who were being arrested. So I started a, a misdemeanor veterans court. It was the first one in Brooklyn and the first one in the state of New York. And I'm proud to say that there are much more vet, misdemeanor veterans courts now. Hi, Judge. And I know my I'm time sorry to interrupt. Up, we're, just, we're at time, if you don't mind just finishing your thought. Sure. But I just wanted to say that I'm a very big proponent of alternatives to incarceration. It's what I've been doing. That's why I decided to stay in criminal court uh, for these 10 years, because I feel that this is the court where I can do the most good. And it was also the court where I saw the majority of people who were coming through who look like me. Thank you so much. And uh, just quick yes or no, uh, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? Well, I, I, I will parrot almost in a sense what my other colleagues have said. There's, there's a reason why we have the three branches of government so that one is not more powerful than the other. Uh, but what I will say is that I'm, a, I'm very cognizant of, of bail and, and what it can do and, and how it can harm people. And especially since I'm in the youth part, so I know that these kids are not the ones who are coming up with the bail to get them released. It's the parents, it's the guardians. So I'm very blessed in a sense that I have a lot of options in the youth part, which allow me to allow these kids to stay out uh, in the community uh, while they uh, work towards uh, a positive disposition in their cases. And we don't have to um, impose, uh, you know, almost draconian um, sentences on the parents just to get their kids out. Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions for Judge Walker? I have a, I have a quick one, Jesse. Yes. Um, Hi, Judge Walker. I've actually, uh, as a practitioner who, who uh, has appeared in uh, the largest portion of my cases in, in alternatives to incarceration court, the STEP court and uh, Brooklyn Treatment Court, I've, I've appeared before you uh, a couple of times. Um, and so I appreciate all the work you do. One thing that you mentioned in your questionnaire, uh, which I referenced earlier and I think is really important, um, is that you are the only African-American male currently um, I believe serving uh, in the in the criminal court, um, and so um, what can we do uh, to uh, increase the diversity uh, on the bench, but also 
uh, you know, amongst amongst court staff so that, you know, that, that people are getting opportunities and also not for nothing when people come into court, uh, they see people in, in professional positions that look like them. Um, I think that's also very, very important that people not walk into a courthouse where everybody in a position of authority is is a white man. Um, and so uh, I'd really love to hear your thoughts and, and, and how best to address that. Well, I, I definitely thank you very much for that question. And, you know, it's something that I, um, you know, I'm, I'm on a, a bullhorn almost daily concerning that. Um, I would not have had the opportunity to be in the court system as a court attorney, if not for an African American female judge who I used to appear before in Queens when I was doing a landlord tenant court. Um, I'm a big proponent of being prepared all the time. I didn't know that she even knew who I was. She called me up to the bench and she said, Mr. Walker, are you looking? And I said, judge, I'm always looking. And she knew of a judge who was looking for a court attorney. It was never something I ever thought about, never something I thought I could, I could do. So I say that because I know the power of the position that I'm in now. And doing that, I go out into the community. I reach out to people who look like me and others to encourage them to go into the law, to try to get into these positions in the court system because it is so important. Representation matters. Um, just the perception that people see when I'm sitting there on the bench. It's not to say that I'm gonna always um, rule in your favor, but the perception that they are going to be treated fairly and with respect goes a long way in how everything turns out. So thank you so very much for that question. And thank you very much for that answer. Really appreciate it. Awesome, thank you both. Uh, thank you. Okay, just in, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna move us along. But Judge Walker, thank you so much for your time here in uh, with your remarks in person, and also for your time filling out the the questionnaire. It was my absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and up next, we have Judge Saul Stein. Hi, good evening, everybody, and I, I echo all of my colleagues here in saying thank you so very much for doing this, for the patience. Uh, it's nine. It's after nine o'clock already, and this, sticking around is uh, it's really appreciated. So I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I got elected as a civil court judge, and I was initially assigned to criminal court. I now sit in civil court, and we'll talk a little bit more, hopefully, towards the end, because my journey doesn't start with the election. It really starts with going back when I graduated from law school. I graduated, I ended up working in private practice for, for a few years. Uh, one of the positions, earlier positions that I had was with one of the largest law firms in the world. And for many, many people who go to law school, they, that's kind of considered a dream job, a uh, big law. You're gonna make all that sort of money. You're gonna do the huge deals. It's something that so many people who go to law school really, really dream for. And I, I, I wasn't any different than any of them. And I was doing that. I was doing corporate law, I was doing securities law. And it was something that uh, really was where I thought I would end up. And then reality hit. And by reality, I met, I was actually at a table doing a deal when in 2008, the market, the start of the market crashed with the Bear Stearns announcement. And within a couple of months, I went from being, let's consider towards the top of the profession and really, and, and doing well to literally on the unemployment line, asking for unemployment. At the same exact time, my wife, who was working for a large accounting firm, had the same exact thing happened to her. And we went from being able to be doing, being sufficient to working and, and, and really asking for being able, needing help from a law that President Obama signed to get our health subsidy and paid for. I got lucky, I ended up work, finding a judge in, uh, who's working at that point in housing court and he hired me as his law clerk. And suddenly I'm thrust into a new area of law, but a very important area because this is people's housing. This is people where people are trying to live, people are just trying to stay with shelter. And the experience that I had there in housing court, along with the experience I had being unemployed, really is something that just drove home to me how important it is to understand the needs of, of the everyday people. 
and that people shouldn't take anything for granted, no matter where you are at one point in life, it could really come down in, in a second. When Judge Cohn, who I worked for, got elected, we got it put into family court. So I went from housing to family court, another literally eye-opening and life-altering experience. All of these things here are the things that made me who I am today. These are the sort of things I bring with me to the bench. And when I got elected and put in, into criminal court, you know, I, I was scared, uh, like Judge Walker said, because suddenly I'm having here people's constitutional rights and people's freedoms are coming to me, somebody who hadn't looked at a law, at criminal law thing since law school, and suddenly that's going to be on me. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity because, again, like the other experiences, it taught me so much of how to be a person, how to act towards people, and what people's needs really might be. I ended up moving to civil court recently. Hi, Judge. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but we're at time, if you don't mind, just wrap yeah, it up. Ultimately, it's these experiences uh, between my time as a law clerk and all those housing courts, my personal employment experience, and my time in criminal court that has taught me the best way to move forward in terms of being a judge and for Supreme Court. Thank you so much. And just a quick yes or no, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? So like, like the rest of my colleagues, it's something that I, I don't feel we can answer directly, but I can say a couple of things, uh, you know, in terms of maybe, because I know there's at least uh, one assembly member uh, on this call here, when I was doing my, uh, when, I, when I was still a court attorney, but I had been elected already, I went to some training. At that point, it was just after the first bail reform, the, the quite frankly, much needed bail reform in 2019 was passed. And they're trying to teach the court attorneys and, and whoever was by these trainings, some of these new laws. And one of the things that they were describing was, you know, it's with the difficulty of implementation, but also the fact that some of the laws that were passed we're going to probably end up needing tweaking because they wouldn't necessarily actually be as, as working as they may have been intended. And part of the reason that this training, at least, was saying was that it may be somewhat more effective because, as it's been noted here a couple of times, we had the law, it's been changed twice, and people are still talking about it. And to the extent that, it, that they decide to tweak it a little bit more, maybe a little bit more collaboration, a little more discussions uh, with defense counsels with prosecutors, with court staff, judges, in a legal sense, maybe that sort of stuff can help uh, hammer home the bail law that everybody really uh, needs and wants. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and open the floor for any other questions. I have a question. Um, so Judge Stein, do you ever wake up in the middle of the night thinking about a case you wish you handled differently? Um, and uh, okay. so like just one just one situation, if you can describe it. Handled differently, maybe, maybe not, but I've, I've woken up with cases and asking myself, did I do the right thing? And I think everybody, any judge sitting in my seat or in those seats really should ask those questions of themselves. Because if you're hundred percent sure all the time and you think you're beyond reproach, then you're probably not doing your job the way that you're supposed to. Um, there are definitely things that I, I feel that in terms of legal stuff, maybe I could argue this a little bit, you know, when I was writing a decision or, or a rendering decision, I could have articulated a little better. Uh, but in terms of handling and the way I talk to the people that come in front of me, I'm pretty proud of the way that I've done that. I, I tried very, very hard to make sure that the people that come in front of me all feel that they've had an opportunity to be heard. So many people and some, some who come to the courthouse they're not treated necessarily, and I'm not blaming any judge here. Sometimes it's the time of day. Sometimes it's just people are trying, so, it's so crowded, but people sometimes come in and feel that they're not actually being heard and therefore they're not getting the proper amount of respect. And for me, at least, uh, I try to have people make sure that they feel that they've been heard, that they've been listened to. And that way, at least when they walk out of my courtroom, they're not saying, oh, that stupid judge didn't even bother hearing what I have to say. And that's how I want to handle every single person that comes in front of me. Thank you so much, uh, Emil, and, and also Judge Stein for, for that response. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and move us along, but uh, Judge Stein, thank you so much for being here with us and also for taking the time to, to fill up the questionnaire.
Thank you for having me, everybody. It's really an honor. And uh, our, our last candidate for the evening uh, is Edward King. Uh, I want to say uh, good evening to everyone. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, I want to thank all the district leaders, all of the um, people that are in the different clubs, and also the people in the general public that are, that are, that are watching us on Facebook. Um, uh, I guess, first of all, I'm not, I'm not ready to be a, civil uh, a, a Supreme Court justice right now. I'm, I'm, there's a potential for a civil court judgeship coming up, hopefully. And if it does happen, I want to, I want to be eligible for that specific position. Um, I wanted to let you know a little bit about me, and um, I would give a lot of anecdotes, but I'll rather just give you the facts. And the facts are that I've been practicing law for over 35 years. I've been a law clerk to a civil court judge in Kings County. I've been a law secretary to a Supreme Court justice in Kings County. I've been an administrative law judge. Uh, I practice. I've been since 1988. I've been in the private practice of law, practicing uh, landlord landlord tenant. I have a real estate practice, trust and estates. I've represented um, what they used to call till buildings, tenant and interim lease buildings here in the city of New York. I've also represented low, low to middle income housing development fund corporations, HDFCs here in the city. Um, I am a, uh, I, I'm a, I'm a military man. I, gra I uh, spent three years in the United States military as a military policeman. Um, I've been educated, my education is from the public and the private school systems here in the city of New York. I'm a graduate, a proud graduate of the City College of New York. I have a BA in Urban Legal Studies, and I'm a graduate of Antioch School of Law in uh, Washington, DC. Um, as, far as, my, as far as what I do, and to give you a good flavor, my motto is, is that through much is given, much is required. I've been given a lot in my life, and I feel like I have to give back a lot in return. And therefore, I've engaged in a number of things that I give back to my community uh, or, not, or I'm involved with. Um, I am. Um, I, I, I participate, and I and I, um, and I and sometimes run Know Your Right forums for churches and community groups. Um, I I am a participant in ex offender reentry programs for employment by trying to get those folks certificates of relief from forfeitures and disabilities. Um, I participate in a number of senior protect your rights programs. Um, I am a member of a local development community corporation in Crown Heights. Uh, that's geared primarily for seniors in their housing. And I'm also a board member of uh, 500 Men Making a Difference Incorporated, which is a community organization that deals with, and, 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 and I feel the very worthwhile programs in the community, including uh, COVID protection and distribution, uh, food giveaways. We've done all kinds of employment projects, park cleanups, things that, involve your community and require men to show, or and not just men, but people to show leadership and, and to let them know that somebody cares. Also, whenever, wherever, wherever and whenever I'm invited, I always appear, uh, usually with high schools or, 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 um, or, or grade schools even, where they look at me and they see me and I told them that I'm a lawyer. And they, and they said, are you really a lawyer? I said, yes, I'm a lawyer. And I, and I want them to see me because I want them to be very, very proud of me. Um, and I want, I want to be an example to them. And that's, that's what I do. So I've run through very quickly my, my experience, my education, and my community service. But what I Mr. want Pico, to- I'm sorry to interrupt too. Uh, we're, we're at time, but uh, please feel free to finish your thought. Okay, very quickly. I, th I thought I was going pretty fast. <laughs> but what I also wanted to say is, is that uh, I think that you want somebody in, those, in that position who can exhibit a certain sense of not only experience, but also of, of, of knowing what's going on, understanding the law, and then being fair in its application. That's what you want. That's what I think the people out there in the Facebook and uh, hopefully the district leaders and everybody else wants on the bench. And I feel like I represent uh, that kind of a person. And I'm willing, willing to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much. And I think uh, understanding that you're you're looking to put yourself forward for civil court, but also that sometimes civil court judges can be asked to serve over criminal matters. Uh, just a quick yes or no, are you in support of efforts to roll back New York's bail reform? I would put, I won't answer the question in terms of what my political beliefs are, but I will tell you this is that I'm very keen on um, the application of bail reform laws as it relates to what happens to the individual after they get into the system. Because 
from what I can see, and I think where the problem lies, to be honest with you, is that we're trying to impose from a, from a legislative perspective something that is actually a societal kind of, it's almost like you're trying to use bail as a punishment as opposed to a, a, an, insur an insurance that you're going to come back to court, and that's where the conflict comes in. So I think that it's like a thing where we we have to allow our folks to make the decision. It's not. It's, I particularly believe the judges will follow what the law is, but we don't make the law. The law is made by the legislature, and 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 we the people can make a determination as to how we want it to go. And 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 so politically, we have to become more astute as to what's happening, and 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 thereby give or try to give those judges the law as we as they think it should be applied, whether it's freedom or restriction. And then we would have to apply to whatever the law is. That's what I believe. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. King. I just, in the interest of, of closing us out and uh, giving everyone uh, back their evening, I, I'm going to go ahead and and move us on. But I, I do want to just take the time and, and thank all of our candidates uh, for being here with us tonight uh, and also, again, for for submitting your answers to the to the questionnaire that the whole goal behind uh, all of us who started the forum and the initiative was to provide uh, more transparency than we saw happening in this process which has historically been decisions behind closed doors and so uh, i'm really grateful to be here with with all of my district leader colleagues uh, and also judicial del delegates and just anyone interested uh, in brooklyn and that the participation that we get um, from you all as candidates is tremendous. And uh, so we're really grateful for all of your thoughtful responses uh, in your time and energy tonight. And for everyone who made it through the marathon that is this Sunday evening, we can all uh, give us a, a, ourselves a pat on the back. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand it off to Julia to close us out. Thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, and echoing, I appreciate everyone's uh, participation. It has been a marathon evening, um, but it really is a, a champion and, and a win for democracy when we can make sure that the process is open and people know uh, who that who they're going to be supporting on their ballot and who they're going to be uh, meeting at the judicial convention. Um, in terms of next steps for judicial delegates who are still with us, uh, stay tuned to your email and phone. There's going to be a, a virtual um, orientation coming up so that we can get to know, we can know what's gonna be happening at the convention. And so uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you everyone for participating. Um, we hope we'll, we'll give you back the rest of your Sunday evening um, and uh, take care. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Good night, everyone. Everybody do the same. Thank you so Good much. Night. Good night.